bidets are back. The Church of What's Happening Now would love to introduce you to Hello Tushy. Go to hellotushy.com and they have portable devices that spray your butt clean with water. Go to hellotushy.com slash church right now to save 10%. That's hellotushy.com slash church right now to save 10%. The show is also brought to you by onnit.com. Go to onnit.com and use code word church to save 10% on all of their amazing optimization products like Alpha Brain, New Mood, Shroom Tech Immune, and Shroom Tech Sport. Kick that fucking mule, Lee. It's that time. Little Wednesday night action before Austin, Texas. The motherfucking red eye. Packed and ready. Guns are packed. The mule is on the way. And you got the church of what's happening now, cocksuckers. Wednesday, August 14th. September 14th. Are you kidding me or what? Get the cough medicine now, cocksucker. We're going deep tonight. Dip that joint in some formaldehyde. It's the church of what's happening now, baby. Kick it, Lee. Fucking tremendous. You know what? That song was overplayed when I was young, and I got to I hate it's it. It's still overplayed. And I heard it today, because usually when it comes on, I just switch it. I just one switch. It's one of those you just switch. But I heard it today, and I'm like, Jesus fucking Christ. This Sometimes is... you go a long time without hearing yeah. one of the, the oh, ones you yeah. get sick of. A lot of Beatles songs are like that. You get sick of hearing them because they're always played if you're out in a lot of places, but then if you don't hear it for a long time, then you hear it, you're like, God, they were so Were you a good. Beatles fan? Uh, I would not describe my, I, I like the Beatles. I wouldn't describe myself as like a beat. Like Don Barris is a huge Beatles fan. Albums. My mom is a huge like, Beatles fan. You know fan. albums like when you were sure. sitting dinner. Of course. And she put on fucking Let, Let It Be. You mm-hmm. know all the songs on the album. Yep. My sister's a huge Beatles fan. I like the Beatles. I wouldn't say I'm a huge Beatles fan. I grew up fan. hating the Beatles because the people around me, that's all the fuck they talked about. That I'm, I'm more your side. And then... As I got old, I always liked Paul McCarthy solo, and I like John Lennon solo, and then I just went backwards. And there's an album that it switches for me. Once it's really guitar-y, like early on, I don't like none of that shit. Like yeah. They have two albums, like 66 to 60, whatever. It's garbage for me. It's yeah. the second half of their career when they got trippy I like that the shit when they started doing acid and smoking All that pot. stuff, yeah. That was that blew my fucking Like the mind. I want to hold your hand days. It's, yeah, it's I don't want to hear yeah, that I shit. Don't, I don't, don't want to hear that shit. Yeah. I don't want to hear that shit. Lee. What's up, buddy? What's going on, my little goomba leech of death? I'm feeling good. Getting ready for Austin, Texas barbecue. Oh, yeah. Fucking banana cream pie with the wafers in it. Fucking Ooh. seafood gumbo, andouille sausage. Wow. Sh- shrimp and crab meat lobster. I feel like now you're just sh- naming food. Shrimp and crab meat salad with a blue cheese dressing on it. Are you fucking kidding me with big country Texas fucking tomatoes in that bitch? Oh, yeah. I'm going deep. They said to take you to Papa Cito. Somebody hit me today with an email on Twitter and said, make sure you take him to Papa fucking Cito's. He'll fucking write Paul a letter right there while he's eating. And marry one of the <laughs> waitresses down there. Oh, I can't wait. And then I had something kind of fucked up happen last night. What happened? Nothing really fucked up, but like, okay. I always try to be safe. So whenever I take an edible, like I try to wait pretty much like until I'm sober to go home. But even when you're sober... Like, sometimes the next morning, the freeway gets a little bit creepy for me. So I actually got off, like, three exits too early last night and just took the side streets home because the freeway was too much. Like it the, is too Because you were too stoned? I, and I wasn't even that stoned. I was like, it was, like, six hours ago, and I had, like, two stars. It wasn't that bad. It was just... There's times I've taken edibles in the morning like an asshole before a flight, mm-hmm. and I've gotten in that fucking car, 
and you're in that little HIV lane, <laughs> HOV lane. Yeah, and you're HIV boog- lane. You're boogieing and you're coming next to cars by an inch. <laughs> Start getting creepy after the tent. Sure. Like if you take a star or you eat an edible and you get on the 405, it gets fucked up. Oh my god. We did it one time and we were driving. We, I don't remember nothing. We blacked out. The San Diego trip. It took, we, there was an hour in that in that trip that I fucking blacked out. Oh, you don't remember it at all. I was too high. My eyes were wigging out. The the uh, the, the lights were fucking yeah. affecting my eyes. That's the night I got sick. We were going downhill. Right. Yeah. You just yeah, yeah 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 yeah. I can't dog. I can't handle that shit either. Do you either of you remember the first time when you came when you were driving on the freeway in Los Angeles and you had the realization that it's legal for motorcycles to go zoom in through the lanes? Oh yeah. Like mm-hmm. that's extremely illegal in like Chicago or Indiana or any place I've lived in the past. And you're just sitting there in gridlock traffic. And these motorcycles go zooming like 30 miles an hour in between the lanes. How in the hell is that legal? It's so dangerous. It was, I remember, like when I first moved here, I lived in the valley because it was cheap. And, but I was always li- working down there. And the, I would always go down the 405. And one morning, I think like the first week I was there, I got, I got kicked by one. Because like, apparently they didn't like where I was in the lane or something. So as they went by, they kicked my car. I was like, what you the gotta f- pay attention to the rearview mirror. Oh my god! Constantly. Yeah. If, if you're in the HOV or in the fourth lane, you have to pay attention constantly in Los Angeles. Very seldom do they go in lane number one or two or three, right. unless they're coming on. But even when they come on, they shoot right for the HIV and they fucking shoot down that motherfucker. And I tell you, there's times you're just sitting there in traffic and you don't know. What if you got to cut over and you don't see this guy? He's dead. Felicia dead. Michael saw a guy die on the 101 or 170 Sunday morning doing 90. Uh, doing that on a motorcycle? Bam, yeah, with nobody out there. Bam, just fucking Fuck wham. that, dude. Fuck that. What I found out about you recently, Tebow, that I did not know. Yes, sir. Is that you're such a big sports guy. I thought that you were like the fucking third wheel on the show. I listened to you a couple weeks ago. Oh, yeah. You're fucking knowledgeable on sports, man. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, I. uh, Well, you know, this is my twelfth season working at the Red Zone uh, for the NFL, and I pretty much have worked my way to head of research. So I, it was special when it comes to football. UFC and football are my two favorites. No baseball. I like the Cubs. I like baseball. Baseball is probably a little bit after NBA. I would go probably NFL, UFC, NBA, baseball, and hockey are probably tied for whatever. All this soccer bullshit everybody talks. I know you got all, we all have these international fans. They constantly hit us up. You guys need to talk about European soccer more. I'm like, I got too much on the plate to start yeah, watching. Yeah, when you zero, and I were growing up, how old are you now? I'll be 44 Friday. Okay, happy birthday. Thank you, brother. I'm not 10 years year old. And what a lot of people should know is that when I was in high school, there was no soccer. Only Spanish kids that didn't speak English Mm-mm. played soccer on Saturdays at the park. You think I'm kidding you? There was no soccer there was team. No soccer. There was, was a tennis that. team in my high school and so- archery, mm-hmm. but there was no <sighs> soccer. Archery S- soccer until somebody got shot with an arrow. I was just gonna say somebody got shot with an arrow in high school in archery, and that was the end of that fucking course. I never, I never understood. Like the, it's just I understand why people like it, but it's just too long. Like what, soccer? Yeah, it's just too much. Well, it's just for me to watch something, it's for three hours, and then it's zero to zero. I'm just like, somebody I, do something. Somebody I, do something. I always bust these balls about sports on Sunday to sit there for 12 hours oh. and eat wings and shit. You're and a big sports guy? I I used to be. Yeah, I used to be. He's a, he, he, I love I love. He's not sports. as big as I fucking thought he was. Like, there's times I'll ask him questions about yeah. And he'll go, I'm not watching because the New England Patriots are in it, so fuck him. <laughs> I thought he would watch everything, but I have friends that grew up watching everything, so I learned to watch everything. I would get, I had no home, so I would get stuck at Corky's watching all those fucking games all day, making believe I was having a good time praying to get the fuck out of there. Right. And I'll never forget, I bust Lee's balls. One time I went to a car sales convention, and they had different guys talking about their careers and how... They became dealers and all this like shit. Like a corporate gig and kind of thing, you mean? No, it wasn't, I wasn't a comedian. I was selling cars at the time. Oh, and, okay. And you okay. Would, the dealer would send you okay. for a day to a seminar. and <clears throat> You spoke about sales and whatever the fuck. And there was one particular guy. His name was Doug Spetty. And he said two things that always like fucked with me. He goes, 
when you have money, you have to know how much money you have at all times, which I don't have money, so it doesn't really matter. Right. But he was like uh, the guy in the casino in Ocean's Eleven, uh-huh. Andy Garcia, that every hour somebody would give him a piece of paper with what they made, what was in the bank at that time. Remember I was telling you, Lee, that he was like an old school Jew, right? Doug Spedding, and he said that, you know, every hour on the hour, I know exactly what I got in the bank. My assistant brings me a card, and I put it in the top, and all day when I get home, I put him in a paper clip, and, you know, this is, and then towards the end, we were standing around, and Denver's a big sports town. Very big. Like a big fucking Bronco thing. We were talking about it. During the Broncos in Denver, you could do whatever the fuck you want. If you're going to do a crime, it's during the Bronco game. Sure. <coughs> what were we talking about? I don't even crime in Denver. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, you were talking about how you... I don't know, you fucking... So, oh, you know, you know yeah, what yeah. he said to oh, me? Oh, no, that, yeah, that I, car we, convention. A bunch of guys were standing around Doug Spratting. And they were talking Dude. about the fucking Broncos. Broncos this, Broncos that. And somebody said to him, what do you think about the fucking percentages of whatever? And he goes, you know, I don't know much about the Broncos. I'm a friend of Elway's and I go to the games. I'm a fan of theirs. But he goes, I really don't know the numbers. He goes, I, I, I don't have a memory for useless information. And I felt so fucking bad at that time. And I started thinking about it. I was like a young man. I always liked sports. Sure. Like, But at that time, I wasn't really... Like, I was the type of kid that went to a baseball game with a bat and a glove. I went to see the Knicks with a basketball. I'm yeah, one of those yeah, yeah. fucking assholes. Sure, of course. So, uh, one day I just realized you had to make a living. And sometimes if you got to make a living, you can't watch college football all day on a Saturday. Sure. And once you do it, it's very liberating. It's like throwing away your iPhone. Yeah, I can you, see You that. follow me? Uh-huh. You know, for, I can see where you're going. Like, weekend six, your girlfriend's at a park. And here you are with six gorillas <laughs> yeah, eating yeah, yeah. fucking potato chips, farting like me, yep. smelling up a room, you know. And at one point, you got to go, wait a second. Dude, I remember one year I went, I did that kind of throw away your iPhone thing with football uh, because, you know, the team I was rooting for and bet, had bet on was eliminated out of the playoffs. And I was like, so now it's AFC, NFC championship weekend. So this, you know, there's one game, then there's another game, and those are the two teams that go to the Super Bowl. And it's a week off, then it's the Super Bowl. So it's the second and third most important games of the year, other than the Super Bowl. And I'm like, fuck it, man. I'm not going to watch football. Me and my girlfriend went to, we, I went with her friends. We went to Magic Mountain. And it was just like, same thing you're saying, like com- committing a crime at a Broncos home game. There was fucking, and I hate lines, so I never want to go to amusement parks. There was nobody at this thing. Like the roller coaster we would ride would just pull into the thing and they'd be like, if you want to stay on it, stay on it. If you want to get off, get off. Like you I, you never had to wait in lines because everybody was watching those two games. That's a good idea because honestly, like it, like Joey was saying, like if the Patriots don't make it to the Super Bowl this year, I don't really give a, like I, I honestly That's crazy. Really don't. I, I would, like if I was, if I followed the Giants. Yeah. Do you have a favorite, like, yeah, I would, are you kind of a Broncos guy? I mean, you had... Let's take it to the beginning. Uh huh. I like the fucking suits. I like the uniforms. When I was a kid, when I came on the Minnesota Vikings, I liked the colors. Uh-huh. And I tried to watch them, but they were losers. They lost like mm-hmm. four Super Bowls, so I had I couldn't hang out with the Vikings no more. And then one day I was watching football. And I was watching the Dallas Cowboys, and I saw them do that thing they do in the offense, where they first line up, they come up, and their hands are up. And then the guy would go, huh? And then they'd set their fucking hands. Uh-huh. And they had their home colors on, which their home colors are badass. Uh-huh. I think it's the silver. In those days, it was the silver with the blue fucking things and the fucking blue. So I became a Dallas fan. Mm-hmm. Like, I like Dallas. I like that style of football. And then I liked... Uh, once Lawrence Taylor became a giant, I loved it. I loved it. Everybody, everybody on the, liked that guy. I would have liked to watch him. And that was, was like probably was, the end of the coke. I mean, players get busted for coke and all this kind of stuff now. But back then, like Daryl Strawberry, all those guys, that it was such a big thing in the eighties that every, for everyone from Wall Street to the you know all the way down was doing coke. That it wasn't really like if we knew now if. Somebody was in the NFL doing as much coke as Lawrence Taylor was back then. I mean, you, you, 
he'd be done. He would play four or five games. He would piss dirty. He wouldn't be able to piss clean again, and he would just be gone. We never would if they had the same drug testing system they do now in the NFL. We never would have seen the greatness of Lawrence Taylor. That's crazy. I don't think they were prepared for the epidemic they endured. It wasn't remember before Lawrence Taylor, there was a guy by the name of Hollywood Henderson. Yep. That played for the Dallas Cowboys. Cowboys yeah. Sergio Ortega, a fucking listener of this podcast, this Beauty and the Beast, sent me the the my one of my favorite reads of all time is Playboy October of eighty one. They put an article about about Hollywood Henderson. Hollywood okay. Henderson was done at that time. And they put a fucking article out. He starts from training camp in Tarzana when the Cowboys used to training camp up here. There's still somewhere There's around still here. There's still Oxnard, yeah. Oxnard. Oxnard. Yeah, that's right. That's up here. Right. Yep, yep, yep. And he goes, here I am at rookie training camp. I got two hits of acid, three joints, four cigarettes, $40 worth of blood. I mean, he just described what he had. Uh-huh. I don't think I'm going to make it for three weeks. Mm-hmm. You know, when you, that was towards the end of his career or early? That was when he was a rookie. And then just gets from there, it just, he's renting. That's what he was doing with no money. Yeah, he's renting cars. He's going to the comedy store and picking up the uh, Richard Pryor. And then they would go pick up the Pointer Sisters. And they would go free base cocaine in the back really? of the window. Oh, my God. The fucking article is just sensational. And he talks about how uh, Ed Too Tall Jones, for his birthday, got him four women. A black one, a brunette, a blonde, and a fucking redhead. Like that's how crazy Dallas was. Wow. Then the fucking the, the the biggest shock of the eighties was the San Diego Chargers. They had a quarterback named Dan Fouts. Mm-hmm. And I always talk about this. I always think about life like this. That Dan Fouts was built like Lee. Do you remember Dan Fouts? Of course, yeah. Okay, he was built like Lee. Handsome motherfucker. But he could throw a fucking ball yeah. from here to your mother's house and back. And so Air Coriel was the coach. They they called him Air Coriel because he always went to the air. But he also had a uh, running back called Chuck Muncie. Mm, remember Chuck Muncie? Chuck Muncie became a coke snorting motherfucker. So years later they came out with books. You got to hunt these books down about what was really going on in San Diego when they played Miami in Miami. Oh, in yeah. that playoff when Kellen Winslow. Kellen Winslow, yeah. Yeah, when they had to walk him off the field with fucking two guys, and then all of a sudden you see him back there in fucking the fourth quarter, and you're like, what the fuck? How they lost, but they stayed in Miami for a week and bought a half a kilo. and They were nuts. They were nuts as a team. What Lawrence Taylor was doing by himself in New York, the San Diego Chargers That's were doing in San Diego. It was so bad that Fred Dean... The all-star defensive end raised his hand, demanded to be traded. He got traded to the San Francisco 49ers. They ended up winning, check it out, with Fred Dean. And one of the quotes he told him, he goes, why did you leave San Diego? Because there were a bunch of free-basing motherfuckers. Really? Oh, my God. Hilarious. They, they went deep. So the deepest one was that one Sunday night, one Sunday NFL, your show comes on and goes, tragic news out of San Diego. Dan Fouts fell down the scares vacuuming. And he hurt his shoulder. Years later, they were snorting blow. They were paranoid. Uh -huh. Dan Fouts had a gun. And the gun slipped and shot him in the fucking shoulder. They had a liaison to the police department. They called him, and he swept it all under the fucking thing. Like, uh, what's in that? those days, you had one cop you called. Hey, listen, you stab a bitch. You would be great at that job. What's that? Is the like the the like cleaner, the cleaner, like, like the guy the that's in a, what's that show on Showtime? Ray Ray Donovan. Ray Donovan, that kind of job. I think you would be good at that. Well, yeah, because you got to be right on the spot. Like, but that yeah. shit takes too long. The but, people today don't listen. I can't if I go to Lee ten times. Lee, the cops are gonna be in two minutes. Shut your fucking mouth. The attorney comes here within ten minutes. Lee will be talking because he's a sweetheart of a guy, just like my wife. They're too nice to understand that concept. Right. Keep your mouth shut. Keep your fucking mouth shut. Keep your fucking mouth shut. Yep. Keep your mouth. Don't even say a word when you go to the jail. Don't talk to no. When they come over and sit next to you and ask you what are you in there for and you have drugs, that's the fucking snitch. Don't say two words. But people don't listen. I didn't listen, so I get it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I didn't listen, and I came from there. I can't right, imagine. Right. You follow me? I yeah. can't imagine people who didn't come from there. It's very hard. Oh, yeah. And when you talk to them later, you go, why would you say something? Well, they scared me. I told you not to say a fucking word. But today, it's it's different. Lee doesn't know the ropes. 
only people who get even after I beat it into you the first time, the first time after you get it, it's like anything else. Yeah. Once you get kicked on the stomach, then you'll learn. Oh yeah. Once you learn that everything you say is going to really be held against you, and you're you're going to drop your jaw. You're going to go. I was just kidding. I just saw something when a guy said that he fainted. Oh, it was a show about a hooker sting in Florida. Just a disgusting show I was watching. I fucking, <laughs> about a month ago, I was in Denver. And one night I get back to the hotel room and there's a show on about fucking uh, undercover stings. Oh, like sure. One of those Nat Geo shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like always Crime watch TV things. or whatever. And yeah. they put a hooker in a room and they were really a cop. And then as soon as you give me money... And oh, they, and they got the camera set up. They got up. the camera set some up. Shit like that. And it was hysterical. The cops came in, and the guy's like, Oh my God, I feel dizzy. He was like, and I remember, right? He was here on a visitation visa. And he goes, Oh my God, I feel dizzy. And they're like, Sit, sit. And they gave him water. And he's sitting there, and all of a sudden he just looks at the window. And the cop goes, Why do you keep looking at the window? He goes, Because my family's going to be very upset. I. I feel like jumping out the window at this point in my life. And the cop goes, you're suicidal? So they put him in a fucking cell for three days, you know, no fucking shoelaces. Just for saying that. The guy was livid. He's like, it was just an expression. I just said it as a... And he did. He just said it as a fucking expression. But yeah. Joe Gentile. They can do whatever the fuck they want to you, man. If you, When push comes to shove, if somebody at power wants to make you fucking vanish, you're fucked. You're fucked. What a crazy fucking world we live in. Really is crazy. I'm sick of all these people. You, you, have you listened or heard of all this Colin Kaepernick shit? Of everyone's whether he takes a knee during the national anthem, whether he doesn't. Whether it's like who gives a fuck? Even if you want to protest, it's your right to protest. So a bunch of players now are taking knees. Mm -hmm. He was, and what does that mean? He was, taking a knee means what? They were they're in essence not refusing to stand during the national anthem, but they are protesting during the national anthem. All of the uh, racial abuse that's been going on from cops, all the videos that are coming out, you know, that's kind of a lot of them taking their stance to that. And, and then uh, ESPN is eating it up like oh, yeah. it's a soap opera. And then like the, uh, the the Nate Boyer who we had on here uh, like a year or two ago, he went and talked to Kaepernick. I read, and that's that he they came up with the knee thing is what I read mm. because apparently it's a little bit more respectful. They felt like it was more respectful than uh, sitting down. So that's what they're doing, apparently. Very interesting. But it's uh, hold on. Um, fuck. What oh, you, you guys. I mean, you were you guys talking about they can do whatever they want, and I don't know that much about it. But I, I read a couple articles. Do, like they sp supposedly had like secret jails. Like there was one in, in Chicago. Oh, I'm like, sure just, they like, do. Like, have you heard of any of that stuff, Joe? Like. All my life, man. Really? All my fucking life. Fuck. Like, not secret jails, but every jail has a room that nobody knows about. Every jail has a room that doesn't have a camera. Mm -hmm. Every jail has a sector that doesn't have a camera, that the camera can't reach. They do that purposely. They do that purposely. Well, what happened to the tape? It's there. Well, yeah. what do you see? I see him and him talking and going into the hallway. Sorry, Charlie. There's always something that they could. There's a way for them to get around it. Yeah. Abuse their power. Maybe yeah. is that what I want to say? Yeah. Uh huh. You know, there's always somewhere on the walk to the shower where I could get hit with a stick in the prison. There's one fucking opening. Whenever you watch anything on TV about a prisoner, what do they say? We'll get them after the mess hall. There's no guards there. Yeah. there there's they know. always there's always an out. It's so fucking weird that it makes you think. The shame. It makes room. you become a, a conspiracy theorist. Like, there's always an out. There always is. There always is a fucking slip up. So. You know, I, and all the, like, this conspiracy theories. And all, I'm just, I, I don't care. I just get to, a, I'm like, well, so maybe we didn't land on the moon. Maybe aliens really exist. Maybe all this. What does it fucking mean? Who cares? It's not like you're ever going to find out. It's interesting. But it's something that you think about when you're in a flight. Yeah. In between a book and a movie. Not even. Not okay. even for me. And not you, even. You know, you look at the Kennedy assassination, you look at the moon landing, you look at this, you look at that, you look at the... It's all got to by the way. 
if you're going to sit there and dedicate your life to this, it's going to eat you up alive. You just move forward and worry about your little circle. Uh-huh. Like this with your arms. You see that little hug right there, that circle? That's yours. If anybody interferes that circle, that's what you have to worry. There's a circle like this. you got a basket mm-hmm. in front of you. You know? That's it. Yep. If I'm going to sit here and sit here for an hour and debate the Kennedy, it's been done, what, 50 fucking years? <sighs> Who gives a fuck? 50 fucking years. There's been a thousand movies. They, there's been so many movies, they remastered the movies and made more fucking money. And Joe Schmo keeps buying this shit like mm. it really fucking matters. Like, we Somebody don't know how the movie's going to end. He's dead. We, you know, now, what do we have? We have a thousand conspiracies against 9-11. And I tell you, I've heard some valid fucking points. Maybe. But what do you want me to do? Exactly. If you don't fucking open this up, it's, it, it would be very shocking to me if a country would put their own people up to get blown up, but it's been done before. My problem my problem is I'm too gullible. Because like, with some good editing, I believe... You look gullible. I, yeah, I do. Doesn't he look gullible? <laughs> I look like I'd be... And I am. Like, you look like you're easily swindled. What, I mean what have you learned? How long have you been in this town? Me? Yes. I have been here for... What year did I get? Like nine, 17 years. We, that's right. We did the porno thing together. The pool and shit. We I forgot. About yeah, that. we talked about that last time. Well, very what year was that? 97, 98. That had to be like... 99. I must have just got here. Just got here. Let me talk to you about something. You're an honest guy. You, we were talking before the podcast started about. I don't have ten. I don't have one book in me. I have ten, but one of yeah. them pertain to what we've seen here, and a lot of it has been positive. What I would write in my book is the growth of people. What I've seen, people who when I got here were uh, assistant agents, and now they run mm-hmm. a comedy division. And I see them, and they give me a big hug. I still remember them being young, walking around the comedy store, all fucking nervous. You see those people now. And you like, see oh, those people now. Assistant. So like, if you come to me now as a 26-year-old and go, I don't like my job at Gersh. I don't like my job at William Morris. You know, so I'm like, listen, sit tight, because I've seen something here. Those mm-hmm. guys that were getting coffee, fucking, when I got here, those guys that were out every night with the agent, <laughs> laughing at their jokes and going, no, he's not, yeah, you're right, he's not funny. Yeah. Those guys today... Are running this town. Running shit. The guy from CAA, there's another guy from Joe, whatever. Like four of those guys that were assistants back then are now running comedy divisions. Yeah. And they were 20 then, and now they're, whatever, 21, 22 then. Mm-hmm. And now they're in their 40s, and you see them with Maseratis, and you're like, damn. Yeah. I saw this guy when he yeah. fucking, you know, when he was doing nothing. You know, Bobby Lee tells a story about him and I getting being broke at the Latino Laugh Festival, 1999. We were so broke that we had to have a manager buy us dinner because they didn't give you a per diem. Mm. You know, you see uh, comedy routine, people who were supposed to be stars Mm. and didn't become stars. But the main thing I wanted to talk to you about that really makes you think, and I want the public to really know about this, the people who listen to this show. We deal with, I don't know how many comedians in our circle, maybe a, a thousand. Lot. I was going to say. Let's just say hundreds. a thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of funny, and I'm not here to put anybody down. I'm just here to educate somebody and to talk to, uh, Jason's good about this stuff. So now we have a, a, a thousand comedians, and every year out of those thousand comedians, uh, 18 of them get a special from Comedy Central. Mm-hmm. So these are the 18 they choose to you. And there's these other comedians that are working hard that don't have a manager or an agent sure. and just don't know how to get there. And they're hilarious. It's like the people who are too fucking stupid to get to a big college and they go to a community college and they transfer when they get their shit together and now they go to lead the NBA in scoring. But for the first two years of college, they were, they were fucking playing with crayons and sharpening mm-hmm. pencils and... Lighting fires and shit and fucking writing on Dixie Cups and shit, their name. Right. Same thing. It's the same fucking concept. But think about the people who have never gotten those specials, oh. who are really funny, that the public doesn't know about. Oh, so there's so many. So you have to think that the same way comedy is judgmental, you have to think that the media news is judgmental, the stories they report. Absolutely. You have to assume that when we listen to Led Zeppelin, there was really three Led Zeppelins we never really listened to because maybe they were on heroin, maybe they didn't look right, maybe they were all fat and they didn't have the long hair and the look. Yeah. You know how now they'll say uh, they're looking for guys who've never had a seat. That's me, Jason Tebow. Jason, uh, 
they're looking for guys between 27 and 34 and you're like they're looking for funny yeah but the, but no they're looking for a demographic you don't fit it you're out yeah you're out you're dead meat so the same way I and I'm not putting down Comedy Central CNN or anything like that I'm just making an observation that if you think about what they do with comedians out of all the great comics that are around us the ones that get chosen for certain things and you, and we're not hating but you sit there and go, wait a second, how did this guy get this? Oh, there's a lot and of And this guy sure. is the, the fucking king of that. And yep. he didn't even talk to him about this. Right. It yeah. must be frustrating from a certain point because I, I'm one of those people. I grew up in Boston. There's not, and not, I grew up outside of Boston. So all I grew up watching was pre, premium blend. Like that was when I was growing up. All those things. So those are the people you want to see. And then when you have a choice to go see, if you're looking at the schedule at the improv and you see someone who you know that you like their special versus Jason Tebow or Joey Diaz who you don't know their names, you're going to pick the person you, you know already know sure. you like. Sure. Yeah, that's why a lot of us covet those, you know, getting those TV spots, getting those things because now you're selling out in some towns where they probably wouldn't even let you feature. And your act hasn't changed. And your act hasn't changed. Your act hasn't changed one single bit from the time your TV thing airs. You know, you know if you're going to be like uh, on some sort of sitcom or something. You know, it premieres tonight. You're a you're a he selling out headliner. In two weeks later, and your act hasn't changed one bit. Whether you're good or bad, you know, there's terrible, terrible headliners in this country that get to headline for decent pay that. Are just headlining because they're on X Y Z. Who gives a shit show? But you know that doesn't work for a long time. Nope. Because it's a perishable product we, they're putting out. Listen, there's guys that have a certain air or confidence to them, and it's like in any profession, any profession. Like if let's say me and Lee were welders mm. and we welded for some shipyard in Long Beach, but guess what? Lee's a great welder for a 28 year old guy. He's fucking brilliant. Mm. But you know what? I welded in Vietnam with missiles getting shot at me. So I'm always going to get hired over fucking Lee because if the shit gets heavy, I got Vietnam, Lee. What have you been shooting? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. There's always that extra experience. For years, Lee made it f asked the question about were we ever frustrated. But you get frustrated, you learn the ropes, and then you realize that every fucking year, every fucking year, five guys pop up. One, because he was on a reality show. One, because uh, th just, who knows, sure. random situations. Sure. And all of a sudden, there was a situation 15 years ago where a guy was on the first fucking ever reality show, Lee. You were a kid. When reality first started, there was Fear Factor and something else and something else. But there was one show that was like a guy who married a chick, like the first Bachelor. That guy was a fucking comedian who was flaggery, whatever you call it. Like he was at the Fledgling. end. Fledgling. He wasn't doing much. He only worked like 10 weeks a year. Lee, he got huge. So what they did with him. Wait, who was it? I forget his name. And I had just worked with him in Portland, at Harvey's in Portland, like maybe a year before I moved here from Seattle. Mm -hmm. I had just worked with him, met him. He was a nice guy. And he was telling me that he was Was he already on the show then or was he? No. Oh, okay. I came down here and all of a sudden one day everybody's talking about it. Remember that comic? They, yeah. Oh my God. And he was on there and his popularity built. And all of a sudden, what they did was a great story just to show you that you have to have balls in every angle. What they did was at that time, who's the guy that died? Mitch Robert, Sh Robert Schimmel. Oh, Bob Schimmel, yeah. What they did was they had Robert Schimmel and all the improvs Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So, what did they do? This guy got such a big demand that they cut into everybody's schedule on the improv. Jason Tebow, no more Thursday. The guy from the Bats is coming in. Mm. You know, and you lost. But Jason, he was putting, you know. If you, Asses and seats. He was putting 400 fucking seats in every market. They had him out from Monday to Sunday for eight months. He didn't build it, so it went into pizza roll. You know, and this guy was an old school. Like, he had bricks. He had uh, chops, as yeah, yeah, they yeah. say in the business. Sure. He had chops, but he never carried the fuck. He never covered the spread. A lot of the last comic standing. A lot of the guys that won last comic standing at first were feature acts. Absolutely. And two weeks later, they're on the road, dog, getting five Gs. 
headlining. And just they and can't they do can't 25. Come and, and they can't do 25. They got to call <laughs> Gene Pompa and all these alternate comics to fill in the time. Yep. They also did the same with my buddy from uh, the one who fucking stabs himself in the eyeballs and shit. Oh, Steve-O. Steve-O. I actually... You know, yeah. When know Steve-O... Well. Yes. Great guy. But when Steve-O started, at least he was getting on stage and he built it. He would well, bring he two would guys have... with him to do 30. Yep. And he would do 35, 38. Yep. And now he's doing an hour. He taped the fucking special. So, you know what? Like, a guy like that... He's a cool guy. He yeah, he's a, a cool guy. Cool, real cool guy. Because he gets that. He understood that. And he used to, um, when he first started doing that, and he's like, well, now I'm getting paid to headline, but I'm not really a comic. Like, what am I going to do? And, you know, he he paid me to, he would just watch, he would record video record his sets. And he would do 35, 40, he would do everything he could. And he'd like, come over to my place. We're going to watch the watch my set. And I want you to just, like, as a comic, like, help me punch stuff up, help me stretch stuff out, you know, like. And, dude, we did that for... Yeah, I don't know, five, six months or something. That's one thing that I, when I first got here, I lacked his confidence. But I saw myself in fucked up situations every night. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like for me, go to jujitsu now. When I go to jujitsu, there's a part of the class where you warm up, there's a part of the class where you drill, then there's a part of the class where you have to break a guard. Ever since I've been in this advanced class, I haven't broken one guard. I guess I, not only do they fucking sweep me, they submit me. I'm fucking terrible at it. Yeah. That's what happened with comedy. Okay. Everywhere I went, I had to follow Don Herrera, Paul Mooney. I was always in the dungeon. Carlos Mencia. Mm -hmm. Like, I went to the Laugh Factory, the Latino night. Everybody who walked in was there to crush me. Pablo, Paul Rodriguez, and then I had to follow him. So for a long time, my confidence was crushed. What I didn't know is... I was getting killed and I was figuring out ways how to get in little out of binds. Mm. So for the first couple of times I went on stage, yeah, I didn't get a laugh. But then I started figuring out how to get a laugh at the eight minute mark, the 12 minute mark, and yeah. a laugh before I get off. I learned how to improvise a little bit and get out of my fucking joke. Get the fuck out of the joke then. What, what? You got eight people, you're bombing, and you're still going to you're still gonna do that fucking material that's killing you? Go, go, walk. Right. And you learn, and all of a sudden you learn how to get yourself out of binds in comedy. That's the beauty of it. That's what a lot of people can't do. You know, sometimes yeah. we're up on stage and we say something that's fucked up. We lose them for a couple minutes. Last night I told a story about robbing a chick in L.A. one time. I, I fingered her and uh, whatever. She had money in her fucking pocket. Oh, tremendous. And you could see the tone of the room change. Right. But... The 20-year experience knows how to talk through that. Yes. And how to say one word to change the momentum. One word. Something sweet, something lovable, something will change that whole fucking thing around. I remember I saw something brilliant once. A movie came out called... What's the movie with Richard Gere and Andy Garcia where they fucking uh, dirty uh, cops? Oh. Uh, 89, 90. Richard Gere was so <clears throat> big. He was in every 80s thing. What is it? Internal Affairs. Internal Affairs. Internal. You ever so. see that movie? Yeah. Like, no. No, Liam. Why would you? Like, hey. You're busy watching the purple is yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the fuck that dumb show is. But uh, purple he is was, yellow. You know, this guy had just <laughs> won. Whatever the fuck it is. This guy had just <laughs> won. I think he won an Academy Award for Office and a Gentleman. Can you check that out for me if you want? Okay. If he won an Academy Award for that, that was like the biggest fuck. He did a uh, American Gigolo, which yeah, he was big. He had like a ran five or yeah, six like in that a row. was fucking badass. Then he dropped something else. Then he dropped uh, Office and a fucking gentleman, and he was just huge. And then somewhere, you know, I don't know his itinerary of films. I'm not Johnny IMDb, but somewhere he dropped Internal Affairs, and then Internal Affairs. He played somebody that was just a complete scumbag. Mm -hmm. But the beauty of it was, he was a cop. Yeah. Lee, there's a scene where he goes to his ex-wife out to give her money for support. Okay. And he's like, how you been good? And all of a sudden he's like, uh, so what are you doing right now? And she's like, nothing. I'm just going to wait for the kids. He goes... And he just opens up the bedroom and opens uh -huh. the fucking door. Like, it's time to fuck, bitch. <laughs> he had eight girlfriends in this fucking movie, Lee. He was just filthy. He oh was just, he killed his partner. I mean, you fucking, you, you fucking uh, 
cheered for him at yeah. the end, you know. And then he came out with pretty women right away, and he changed your perception. You forgot all about internal affairs. It was mm -hmm. the most brilliant move I ever fucking seen in my life. I don't think Richard Gere won an Oscar. No, I don't think so either. The movie won. Somebody won a fucking Oscar in that movie. Something happened, but who gives a fuck? It's she too won one for that for a Pretty Woman, didn't she? Did uh, Julie Roberts win? Somebody. I won. think she won one for that, and I think uh, uh, Officer and a Gentleman maybe won one. I don't think he got it, but I think that movie won. You said one. you guys are talking about something very interesting. Somewhere the conversation changed. So Hollywood Henderson did his damage. And when I was in high school, when I had quit in 81, I had heard about this guy, Lawrence Taylor. And one night, it's Thanksgiving. And my friend was supposed to pick me up. We're going into Harlem to pick up an eight ball and whatever. And I'm watching Lawrence Taylor on the outside with a white jersey on, 56, mm -hmm. and his fingers are moving. And he's got his left leg up first, and he's ready to block. And all of a sudden, he faced like he's going to go in. And the quarterback takes the ball and immediately looks to his left, and just throws a pass in the three-yard line. And all of a sudden, you see Lawrence Taylor scoop it and run it back the 97 yards on Thanksgiving Day. Uh -huh. My head blew up. I'm a defense guy. I like people flying and throwing fucking balls and shit, but I'm a defensive guy. Sure. Lawrence Taylor sucked me in, but then I started hearing things. Like, I was out copping. And I would hear about... You were uh, in New York at his, I'm in New York. run, I'm right? in New York in at this 80s, run. In the 80s, that's where you were. I'm in New yeah. York at this run. Sure. So, 83, there was a party for Z100. That's that a radio station? A, a radio station. Uh -huh. And that's the first time I heard anything, Jason T. But all of a sudden I hear, these girls from my hometown went. And they came back and their heads were blown. They're like, you're not going to believe it. Everybody had blow. Leonard Marshall... Fucking, Leonard Marshall, fucking sure. Lawrence Taylor, Leonard Marshall. and I'm like, no, Lawrence Taylor does not do coke. Like at first, I got the like I'm mad, and then I go. But now you, you're at now the time I'm doing coke. Yeah, I'm fucking. So uh, why were you shocked that he? Because did? he was one of my heroes. Oh, because you had him on. A yeah, pedestal I had him on a your head. It's yeah, like yeah, Julius okay. Serving. I find out he's a woman beater. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Julius yeah. Serving's a saint. All his life, he's never done a fucking thing except his son was a junkie. But it ain't his fault. You know, mm -hmm. like sometimes you got to yeah. give one to get one. So. uh when Lawrence Taylor started going around, I started hearing little stories. And then I moved to Colorado. Uh -huh. And that winter, I'm hearing stories that not only are the fucking uh, the Giants buying blow and stuff, but they're hanging out in the bar I was hanging out with. And they would lock the door and take it out yeah. and snort Leonard Marshall, a couple of white dudes. And at this time, my friend was a ball boy for the Nets. And he's selling coke to Daryl Dawkins. And Daryl Dawkins is giving him his sneakers so he could sell them after the game to make more coke money. Fucking tremendous fucking stories because they get a new pair of sneakers for every game. Every game, yeah. I didn't know that. They so usually was, give them away to some They give them away, yeah. yeah. Some sort of not this story. guy, not Daryl Dawkins. He was giving them to fucking whatever this kid name was, Noel, and Noel would sell them. Mm -hmm. He would sign them. Just crazy shit. So I left, and that winter I was hearing all these rumblings. So I come back February of 84, and I'm, I'm just, I go from fucking being a saint, like not really, I'm not gonna lie to you. I was at least trying to. Sure. And then by the summer, I, it, it was everywhere. Cocaine was everywhere. It, it was to the point where Lee was selling coke. Like Lee would call me up and go, listen, my neighbor came over here and asked me if I know anything about cocaine. I know you like it. So I got you some. Really, Lee? Yeah. Fucking Lee, man. I'll be right over. How much did you get me? I don't know. He said it was two pounds, 2.2 pounds, a G-Lo. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what the fuck? That's how it got. Mm. Because people were getting it. At one point in 84, it was, it was everywhere. It was like the weed stores now. I always compare it to the growth of the weed store. That's interesting. And Scarface is fucking ripping it. It's on, it's on VCR now. And everybody's at home watching Scarface. Every time he says fuck, yeah. they're doing a line of coke. It was out. The summer of 84, you got Scarface. You got Michael Jackson. You got Bruce Springsteen yeah. born in the USA. You got Michael. And you got Blow everywhere. And yeah. everybody's selling it. And the most unlikely people are fucking selling Blow. Uh -huh. And people are saying to you like, Joey, can you get rid of this? I don't know. I'll ask Tebow. Now, weren't, weren't people really doing it 
it wasn't as secretive, right? Like, because it, it wasn't no, as bad for you. At and that point, as bad. No, at that point, nobody was really. There was a few ads that said, uh, "I lost my job, I lost my house, I lost my car." Let's, like, it, let's ad party. executives, yeah. all ad executives very, were going out. It, was, it went from a white collar drug right. to by a eighty-five. Drug. People were already fighting it. Yeah. They were fighting fucking the Colombians, Pablo Escobar. It was on, but. On the streets of New York City, Miami, yeah. you know, anywhere you went, you'd get coke in five fucking minutes. And I had friends that were, like I'm telling you, guys that worked for the town of North Bergen that were like plumbers. They were calling me up and going, dog, can you come over here? I guess the neighbor's Colombian? And he wanted me to ask if anybody could, he, he gave me an ounce. Yeah. Take it. And I would go, are you fucking serious? And it wasn't just fucking, it was real. 1984, your eyes still got See, red. Yeah, I, I, only because I was so young back then, uh, you know, 84, so I was probably like 6, 15, 14, something like that back then. I never had like big Coke runs. I never had, you know, back then. But it was definitely around. I remember my father doing Coke. I remember all his friends doing Coke and that whole scene. By the time, like, I'm like, old enough to be dicking around with drugs or anything like that, it, the weed was already coming. It was already starting to be weed. You know, it was before, you know, then there was that whole ecstasy. That was a quick thing, everybody doing ecstasy. Was, it felt like a, I think that's just like a young person's drug. Well, all that stuff just evolved. Listen, my yeah. quaalude became their ecstasy. Totally right. Then ecstasy became DMH and this became this, but it's here. So here you go. My turn is it was Valium. Valium. So... October of 84, I'm gone, Tebow. And me and my friends went to a giant game to watch the Tampa Bay Buccaneers against the Giants with a running back called James Wilder. Okay, I don't even remember James. That was a beautiful fucking man, and he could run the ball. Lawrence Taylor's at the top of his fucking game. Okay, at that point, October, everybody knew, listen, here's the, listen, here's the plan, dog. Lawrence Taylor, what do you want to do with him? Right. You got two options. You block... And you play the rest of the field, and you throw away from him, and you run away from him, or you could run at him. Both ways you're going to lose. Yeah. Both ways he's going to figure it out by the second quarter, and you're going to be buried. And that game I saw something that I had never seen before. Like it taught me about life. Tampa Bay said, we're going to tell you what we're going to motherfucking do. He snorted the entire 43-yard line. No. no. Tampa Bay, he came out, and he goes, give me the fucking ball, and I'm going to run it right at Lawrence. Nobody's ever done that before. Mm-hmm. Nobody's ever done it. Let's try. It worked. He cracked Lawrence Taylor. And what fucked me up after that is nobody ever caught that. Mm. Because Lawrence Taylor was always chasing. Nobody ever went at him. They went at him. I'm, I'm telling you. He every, was probably shocked at that, too. Every play was down Lawrence Taylor's mouth. Yeah. Right down, You know what? We're going to give it to you. Yeah. You want to run the outside? He's going to be running there. And Lawrence Taylor kind of sort of... And I learned something even about life. Just go, go. And I'll never forget that game. So now I go crazy. I try to get my life together. I stop doing blow. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who a house burns down. House burned down? Like half of it burnt down. So the, the insurance company in those days put you in a hotel. Right. And they put her up. It could be a Marriott. I'm too old now. I used to know the name then. It could have been a fucking Marriott. It could have been a Hilton. But anyway, this place had the best happy hour at the time. What city is this? It was in Lynnhurst, New Jersey. Okay. Okay. Lynnhurst or the town next to it. And they pretty much, and you're hearing this from Joey Diaz, I'm a fat fuck. They invented the happy hour at that time. Yeah, uh, the ground round had the fucking Monday night football game with the meatballs and the wings and shit. But this place gave it to you for gratis on the arm. And I'm talking about glazed wings on Lee Lanks. I like barbecue. They had that. They had wings. Uh -huh. They had meatloaf. They had pot roast, mashed potatoes. People with fucking, uh, uh, you know, caterers with, with fucking suits on giving you food. So this girl tells me, she goes, you got to come. The Giants are downstairs. Oh, shit. They're down there every fucking night. Oh, Boom, I get to the hotel. At the time, I'm trying to be clean and sober. I'm smoking she, and she's dope. she's staying there just because that's she's where they a, put her up. Her and her mom got two separate mm -hmm. rooms, and she's a fucking nut. She, she's a fucking, the real deal, holy for you. It's 1985. I'm 22 years old, maybe, 21. Uh -huh. 
I'm the real deal, holy feel. I'm just looking for a gun or an envelope to end up in jail. Uh-huh. And I end up going over there one day, and they're all there. The Knicks are there. Cool and the gang is there. Cool and the gang. Wow. Oh my God, because they're all from Jersey. So it's a it's a it's a prior it's a predominantly black bar. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That was connected to the hotel. It was no, it was in the hotel. Like this is oh, a hotel the... bar, and all okay. of a sudden this was the fucking spot. Yeah. From five to nine every night, nobody knew. This is where everybody, who everybody who went to the city looking for yeah. these guys, were here. Right. The Lynnhurst Sheridan. Nobody knew about the Lynnhurst fucking Sheridan. I get a call. I get down there. Lynnhurst Sheridan is rocking and fucking rolling. Sure. I see the center from the Knicks, not Patrick Ewing. The other guy. Yeah, before that, I uh... see Cool in the gang. I see uh, the the guy who ended up tackling Cunningham. That was number fifty five on the on the. Remember, the Giants had two linebackers. They not only had Lawrence Taylor, uh, but they had the other yeah, motherfucker. Yeah, yeah. I saw him in there. I'm like, oh, shit. And the whole night, I'm watching him, and as 9 o'clock comes, and they take away the food, they play like black music, and they're dancing, mm-hmm. and you can see some of them, their jaws are going. And, yeah. and the word on the street is that Lawrence Taylor shows up there. So I said, fuck it. That's my hero. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And at this time, if I meet my hero... I'm gonna have a fucking G bo. I don't give a fuck what point, what part of my sobriety. Yeah, I'm going off the deep end for LT. Totally. I fucking shoot up. I come back Friday with an eight ball. I go to the fucking bar. I'm sitting there. I have not done it yet. I'm drinking at that time. In those days, I used to drink rusty nails. Oh That's yeah. That's how deep I was in that yeah, time. Yeah. In the cocaine world. <clears throat> but I would open up with a uh, disgusting. Disgusting Southern Comfort and orange juice. Oh, I was, uh, you know what, back in that time, ne- neck of the room for me, it was always seven and sevens and white Russians. <sighs> what about white Russians? White Russians after, it's too much sugar. Yeah. The next morning you wake up and it's a sledgehammer. No, I'm and, saying just and, to kickstart the party. Oh, no, no, no. Three no. or four of those. I love those. I love those. Yeah. I love those. I can't drink them, drink them all night. I couldn't drink them all night. With a little dot of Irish cream. Yeah, but I couldn't drink them all night. A little dot of Irish cream or amaretto to put, not amaretto, uh, the other one, the almond. Amaro. Uh, 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 no, the creamy one. Yeah, uh, almond milk. No. You can do stop, that with that. Stop. I wouldn't put almond milk in your <laughs> cocktail. What type of fucking soldier would I be? I put almond milk in your fucking cocktail. What are you you're talking about? Um, But you had to put, that's the cream you would use for it, though. Yeah. Just that. Yeah, just so, a touch of it. So now I get the, I called, her name was Tasia. I called Tasia. Like, I'm coming down. I that's one whose house burned down. Yeah, and yeah. I called her. And I go, I got a package. She goes, bring a cab. Let's have a great time. I go there. I don't do nothing. I don't even. I tell her I have a package, but it's coming. I'm gonna. It's ten minutes away. Yeah. She keeps calling the bar. To give it the phone to Joey because she knew everybody at this time. She was there for like two weeks, and by this time she was running the joint. She yeah. was coming down. Tab. There was a tap. She'd come down, see you sitting there, put on his tap. Hey, how you doing? Give me a hug. She was the real deal. <clears throat> so now it's about nine thirty, and who do I see walk in? LT yeah. with football shorts, but cut. No, really? No elastic. A leather jacket down to his ankles. <coughs> White socks, sneakers, and like a football practice jersey, like the ones with the holes in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. No, exactly. What you're and shit. Sure. And he walks in with a leather jacket, and he orders like a cocktail. He's wearing essentially practice a gear like he's and a from leather fucking, coat and it's 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 uh it's june now by that oh, time yeah, great of course now by is. that time and you asked your brother ari shafir mm-hmm. by this time not only were the, the giants the jets the knicks hanging out there but the generals were hanging out there too oh. and i met a guy that i used to talk to every time i was in his name was herschel walker he was the nicest guy in the world everybody and, says that and one night Five years ago, me and Ari at the UFC, and I look up, and there's Herschel Walker, and I, go, I ask Ari, I go, Ari, watch what happens when he sees me. And as soon as he saw me, he was like, oh, shit. We couldn't talk or where we had been, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Because we bad. both, had to, I mean, I saw him in there. Did he do blow? No. He was, he's the nicest guy in the world. He was in there getting his dick sucked. There was white mm-hmm. broads, you know. In those days, you could take a white broad in the car and get your thumb ink, you suck, and nobody said nothing. Because, in those days. Yeah. Oh, my God. They were Nowadays, like, it's rape. It's rape. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fucking crazy. So now I see. Isn't that cool when somebody like that, that you're such a fan of, you know, you meet them, you know them, you get to know them, and when they come by and they're like, hey, Joey, what's up? You're like, holy fuck. 
that's fucking Herschel fucking Walker knows 30 me. fucking years that we, because I, some, and then I saw him once, and we reconnected, and I go, this yeah. guy's good with faces. The time I saw him, he surprised me, so when I saw him with Ari, I go, he's going to remember me. And sure enough, he goes, hey, oh my God. No shit, remembered you, totally remembered you. It's crazy, but here it is. This yeah. is the fiend I was. You ready, Jason? I just call you Jason. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, man. I'm cool with it. I'll just call you T-Bone. You story, call me whatever you the want. The story was Lawrence Taylor orders a drink and goes, I got to pee. And he goes to the bathroom and guess who follows him like a little bitch? I'm going to throw a stab Joey. at you. Yeah, of course. And I follow him in there and I walk up to him and I go, dog, I got some shit that killed the mule. And he goes off on me, Tiba. Really? What the fuck are you talking about? Get that shit away from me, you punk ass bitch. I'll fuck your world mm -hmm. up. He wouldn't shut the fuck up. Was he fucked up already? No. Okay. He was straight as an arrow. Okay. He walked in there. His eyes were clear. I looked yeah. right in his eyes. Sure. His jaw wasn't going. See, if right. I fucked up, if his jaw was going, he, so he would have said, give me a taste of that. Because mm -hmm. once your jaw's going, your mind's thinking, I might run out of mine. Yeah. Let me take half of his. Nobody will know nothing. Yeah. There's once no cameras in the bathroom. Once you're in, you're in. Once you're in, you're in. Lee, how you doing over there? <laughs> look at Lee. You look a little stoned, Lee. I'm doing, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually doing pretty Lee's good. going to Austin with me. Fuck yeah, I'm going to Austin. That's so going to be fun. The, Are you guys going to do a live pod from there? No. Nothing like that? You're just He's just coming along? He's coming along. He doesn't, he never goes on. On the road, I know he's a foodie. Mm, you love Austin. You know, I, I know in the morning I'll wake up and we already be gone. I found a place that I can't, I know I can't go because he'll have spies there now that I'm going to mention it. But all they do is cheeseburgers made with donuts, like donut for buns. All right, how far from the hotel? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Where the, I didn't do that search yet. All right. <laughs> we'll see. See, this is the shit he wants. Fair to food. You want to eat fair food? He's I'm not going to go see, there. See, you guys go to Elephant Lee, while you're, you're at gonna, it. You're going to go there. I don't blame you. Go take a pictures and come talk about it on the podcast. I'm no, gonna... I've never had a, I've never had a dinner burger, but that's what Yelp shows you. Oh, and actually, for all your Yelp hate, did, did you see the uh, our, the news last week that now they're allowed to take money to uh, boost reviews? Yelp is? Yeah, they just, ah, that's they, a kiss of they death just for wanna, them. They just want a court case. They say they don't. They say they don't, but they just want the right to. That ruins their legitimacy. Yeah. Even if it's not already ruined. You know, man, if you go on a website yeah. before you do business with somebody, you're three steps behind anyway. Mm. I could call five people right now and go, Lee, do you know a photographer? No, but let me call Paula. Maybe she knows somebody. Right. And right away, so if, if you say to me... I, I never understood that. I take your word. Your family. I take your word. Mm -hmm. Why would I yelp somebody? Why would I? You know, I'm a fat fuck. I hear things about restaurants. I try them out. Do you want me to yelp them to the world and throw the people under the bus? No. Out here, nine out of fucking ten restaurants I go to eat ass. They're overrated. I, I don't get well, it. Well, it's also that other thing, too, where it's like, who goes to see a, a movie and... Uh, writes a letter to the theater that's like, hey, I just want to let you know everything went good. I had a good time at the movie. Thanks. The air conditioning was a little off. But my, other than that, it's my perfect. My husband sweat. Once the plane hit the river with Sully, my husband started sweating. What the fuck? Yeah. He knew what was going to happen, cocksucker. Yeah. But it, with the people that do contact the movie theater are the people that are like, hey, that was a dead rat in my fucking popcorn. And, you know, if you're pissed off, you will, you'll take action. If everything's fine, you don't say shit. So you read all these reviews and it's just a bunch of people saying horrible shit. Yeah, that's all it is. I would never walk into a restaurant because of a Yelp review. No. I'd rather t Row come over to me never. and go, Joey, you ever go to that I've place? never done it. When you work Zanies, Joey, around the corner, there's a place then. Yeah. You know what that meatball hero, remember with the fries? They opened up one. I'm going because you told me. Mm -hmm. You stayed there from sure. You know, it's so weird for me and I try to fuck with Lee and I'm happy he's going there, but I have to take Lee like Lee's going to Chicago. Have, Have you, you ever been to Chicago, Chicago before? Lee? No, I've never been to Chicago. Lee, <sighs> you know the weirdest thing when I went there last time, and I hate saying this in front of Chicago mm -hmm. people. The last time I went there, the best meal I had was oatmeal and coconut milk. Really? The restaurant had it on the menu. I ate it and for it was six fantastic. Months. Fantastic. Where we were, at? 
Wherever Zanies put me up a hotel, like oh, three doors down. Oh, because they have the condo right behind the club, but, they, <coughs> but you never stay there? No, they put me in a hotel. And like, you were at I, the downtown Zanies? The, this time I'm in Rosemont. That's right? what, that's why. I shoot why. the specials okay. in Rosemont. But that place has like those high-end restaurants. When I work down in Zanies, Lee would like that. Yeah. Like next time I, I tape the special. Because that's all I'm going to take around. Lee, go in on Wednesday and just let him walk around. Mm -hmm. Lee will come back 10 pounds heavier. He already shipped bratwurst. Oh. To fucking California, the guy's gonna mail it from tomorrow. Austin's great though. Austin's great Austin's food. Austin's great too. Chicago's great food though. Chicago's great. great and, what, and the problem with Chicago and places like that for guys like you, the native, is that you know the spots. You know, it's like if I go there and go listen on planes, cranes, and car crashes, yeah. the, the chef goes to this place, <laughs> yeah. and you're like, listen, Joey. Ever since he went in there, they're fifteen ninety nine. I got a place, yeah, where it's a black guy that picks his nose. That's how good it still is, sure. And they're six ninety nine with sauerkraut and oh. all. And you follow me, you know the place. You know, so you know more where not to go. Like right, where it's you so know crowded. exactly like, where not. Did you to go, go there on a Saturday at six o'clock? What you know. You go to like Rush Street to go have cocktails on a Saturday night. It'd be like, no, n nobody there goes there. That's like, oh, let's go walk around Hollywood Boulevard on Friday night at nine. You know, that's all tourists. You know, it's all people that want to, you know, nobody hangs out at Hollywood Boulevard that lives in Hollywood. You know, we avoid that place. We got the little cracks in the wall. You know, the little dives. Keep those places in business. You know what I mean? All these giant corporate fucking fake places. I, li I like. I loved the mom and pop. I'll take a dive bar over with a jukebox and 12 seats and that's it. And the same bartender that seems like they live there. Like you could go there at six in the morning. You can go there at two in the morning. They're still there. You know, I'll take that over the fucking saddle ranch and all these big ass fucking. That was the transition in partying that got me. It was what? That was the transition in partying where I fell apart. When I was young, I went to a couple of those clubs. It was fun, but I knew it wasn't my world. You Not know, my the world. big dance clubs, uh, the the one where you drank for free till six. That was cool. The couple mm -hmm. times, the three or four times I went, I had to go for the rooftop. It was, you know, I went with ten of my friends. You get lost for two minutes, and you meet them again. You talk, but I knew it wasn't my world. I had grown up in a neighborhood bar. My yep. mom had a neighborhood bar. Yep. She fed the neighborhood. They came in. You drank when the food was done. There was always a container on the, on the bar with a con sandwiches cut already, a little ham and cheese sandwiches with a thing with a fly in there. You could open it up with a fly. It was just, that's the feeling I want. Yes. I go to a bar now, I got to hear music I don't want to fucking hear. Mm -mm. I'm deaf. You go to Vegas, somebody asks you to go to get a drink, the music's fucking blasting. I can't even hear you. I can't, no. I want to go to a place where I don't want to hear shit. You want to shoot pool, but conservatively... Go over there. Once you start bringing people who look like uh, Sons of Anarchy, I don't want to be there. I just right. want to be there. When, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I yeah. want a place where the drinks are cheap. Yeah. I could curse. Nobody gets insulted. Yeah. It. When my Give first, me a bar where you can still smoke inside. When I first moved to Hollywood, there was a place on Santa Monica and Gardner. There's a little uh, a fast food joint there on the corner. Okay. Okay. It's fucking, you'll get gonorrhea from eating this. It's lizard meat. But across, <laughs> lizard meat? But across from there, across, Lee's on lizardmeat.com. Yeah, I'm that's, going to see where it is. That's the fucking page he likes. Uh, Astro Burger. Oh, shit. That's still shit, there. Astro Burger. It's still there. That's where Astro Burger is. It's still there. But 10, 15 years ago, only the man himself, Doug Stanhope, found the place that the breakfast is good. Plus, you could smoke cigarettes in there. Of right? course. Where is it? It's a, is it a bar they right there? They tore it down. Mm. It was like a, they fronted it. It was like a restaurant mm. with one table up front. They didn't mm. really want those people there. And then you had to know the owner, and you go into the back, and it was outdoor seating. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking and about. You used to it smoke had the cigarettes. wooden, like a wooden yeah. fence with two eggs, vines sunny on it. side up. I know exactly what you're talking about. Toast and shit, oatmeal, not bad. It was like a Mexican name. Like yeah, L yeah, yeah. Something. They were something weird. Mm -hmm. they, they were nice people, but I never mingled. When you would go in the restaurant part, it didn't even look like it was open. There'd be like one yeah, Mexican yeah. guy they standing like in there. They had leaves and shit. And you're like, is this even then open? And then a, when you go in the back, there's like 40 people. They had a petition to keep it open, and they fucking lost. So I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, the Daniel Stewart used to live right by that place. Wow. Astro fucking Burger. A lot of times I went in there at 2 in the morning to get a, 
Anything. Like a mushroom burger or something. Their burgers aren't and bad. And I was living in my car. Yeah, you try living in your car. When you're parked yeah. in at four in the morning, you got to go to the bathroom. And you're on E, and you got to start the car and go to a park and take a shit. That's when Astro Burger, you learned to hate that shit because he I failed bet. you at a tough time. You know what I'm <laughs> It failed you at a tough time. I went there, I gave you my confidence. Now here I am in my Nissan Sentra on fucking Vista. Parked the other way, and I got to take a shit. I already fought it three times. I got the sunroof open. I got the four windows open. How long have you known Stanhope? What year did you guys meet? Did you meet in L.A.? No. I'm, I'm ready for I met this. him out here. 1991. Get out. I'm lying to you. 1992. <laughs> I started comedy story. June of 91. I won the contest December 18th of 91, and I talked the management at the broker in out of the fucking magician. He, they had a magician who was a host. He was really old, and he was just fucking terrible, and people would throw shit at him. Really? And I pointed it out to the management, so they gave him movie night, and they gave me comedy night. I thought, not to hurt his feelings. They go, listen, we're going to put you on movie night. Do a couple tricks. Introduce the movies, and then don't let the door hit in the ass. <laughs> His name was like Magico. Or so. He was awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Magico. It was fucking horrid. So I started hosting at the Broker Inn on Tuesday nights right. for the Bex Comedy Night, 1992. I had like eight minutes of material. And the, eight minutes? Every Tuesday, a new headline. Can you imagine Joey Diaz with only eight minutes to his name? Oh, my material. God. Oh, my God. So you do the same eight minutes every week? No, because the same customers came in every week. I had already figured it out after six months of comedy that the same motherfuckers came in because not only did you get to watch comedy for $15, you got a steak, a baked potato, mm. and a fucking salad. That's a good deal. Okay, so people would come in at 7.30, eat, and then the comedy show would start about 8.15, 8.20. Cocktails, too? They got this open bar? And like open no, bar, no, 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 no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it was known for being a big pickup joint on Wednesday nights. Okay. Wednesday was uh, their... Mingle night from fine. They put shrimp bowls out, and people would go in there with their fingers and eat shrimp. And oh my god! Pee. Oh yeah, yeah, shrimp. When you went to the broker in those days and sat down to eat dinner, you know how they bring you bread at restaurants. They brought you a shrimp bowl, mm. and you sat there, and they had a curtain so you could give your wife a stabbing in there, or sucky sucky, <laughs> or do a little twist. A stabbing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can tuck a... some dick into your wife. Oh yeah, yeah. This is some crazy shit, but that's where I. Is it one... still there? Still, I don't know if it's still there. You have to look it up. One night, on a Tuesday night, I went there, and there was a little kid with long hair, skinny, young, and his name was Doug Stanhope, and he was featuring, and we started talking, and in those days, it was a complete run. Yeah. So it was Boulder on Tuesday. You had Wednesday off, and then you had to go to a fucked up part of Colorado, like fucked up, Craig, Colorado. Which is where? This is, I have no idea, and but on the itinerary, when I did comedy there six years later, on the itinerary for that night, it said, this room is active. Do not, in, uh, uh, what's that? When somebody says something to you and you say something back? Oh, like interact? Do not interact. interact. Get off the stage, go to your hotel room, and let management call you. No, really? Why? Because it's, it's like... And the, when I got there... Out or is it? When I got there, it was, it was you on the stage... 20 feet of a fucking open room and then there was a glass and they would watch you from the other side of the fucking glass. Really? Because there had been so many fucking problems at this place with comedians and comedians would lash out at them and Craig is like the side. At that time, I don't know the population now, at that time, it was a, a Thursday night that paid Tribble a lot of money, like $3,000 a week. They thought they were getting fucking Milton Berle and they were getting Uncle Joey Diaz. Mil Uncle Milty. They got all Joey Diaz with his eight minutes of comedy coming in. So they, you, you had Craig on Thursday, <laughs> you know, like Colorado Springs on Friday, and you had something on Saturday. But that Tuesday night, that Wednesday hurts you, bro. Yeah. Because if you're a feature, trip only gives you 50 bucks. You got 85 for the night, and you pick up 50. Yeah. A hotel in those days is 25. You got a Subway sandwich, a six-pack of beer, and a you're pack you're of breaking cigarettes. even. And you're breaking fucking even. A lot of those tribbles were always breaking even. You're always it's breaking you even. You just cut your chops Yeah, off. because there's a by the way during the week. Oh, you're doing that to, because you want stage yeah, time. Yeah, you want stage time. And you, you want to learn The money people. that you get will get you to and from and probably something to eat and maybe, maybe a place to sleep. And that's it. You don't come back with money, but you come back better at comedy and seasoned. It's funny how... Uh, so a I, little used, bit. I used to look at the comics. I had just gotten divorced. 
I had a two-bedroom house. I had a living room. I had a couch. I had a TV. And I would look at how cool the features were. Or the headliner. Mm -hmm. You know, if they were dynamite guys, like I got along with and stuff, I go, where are you staying tonight? And they go, I'm going to think about getting a hotel for 60 bucks. I go, keep the 60. I was a, I was a starving comic. I, no, I, I wasn't starving yet. I still had credit card money. I still had the condo because I was living in it. And I would bring them over and basically pick their minds. Let them sleep. I'd have weed. If they wanted to do a couple of bumps, I'd get a couple of bumps from them. And we'd wake up in the morning, they'd take a shower, and they'd go to Craig, Colorado. Mm. And Stan Hope was one of those guys I met. First time he came as a feature. <laughs> Eight months later, he came back as a headliner. He had just done uh, the big show at the time, Inside the Improv. Uh, what was the name of the Night at the Improv. Night at the Improv. Yeah. He had just done that, and now he was a headliner. And he was on his way. I could uh, tell when I saw him eight months later. I'm like, this kid's on his way. You saw the difference between feature to headlining. There was something in, in him months, that changed. Yeah. And then I didn't see him. We lost contact. I got heavily into comedy, but I kept missing him. Then you, him, and Herschel Walker all ran into each other. <laughs> yeah, I, I kept missing him. I kept missing Doug Stanhope. Doug Stanhope had just been here three weeks ago. He ripped up this room. Mm -hmm. At this time, it's 96, 97. 90, no, 94 at this time. I'm feeling, you know, I'm okay. I've been doing comedy for three years on paper, but solid for 18 months like a warrior. Yeah. I got something to work with. People, are st I'm still not bringing down the house, but I get my moments. You know what I'm saying? And it's mm -hmm. only going to get better. I'm into it. I write. I, you know, I do my thing. I'm living in my car. And I'm in Seattle. I go to Seattle. And I actually start featuring up there. Like, that's the first. I, I featured, my first feature weekend was for Lori Kill Martin. She's a writer mm, on I know her. End I know exactly who she is. And, uh. She still the gigs around every now and then. Yeah, yeah. She's at the store and shit. And, yeah. I, and I stayed there and I joined, did the contest and I semi finaled. And, and no, there's a bunch of shit that, uh, uh, went, uh, whatever. And then 96 came and Dog, the hottest name in comedy, was Doug Stanton. Mm. Like you heard about this from fucking everywhere. Mm -hmm. Then he won the San Francisco County uh, that, Competition. I met him right after that, and bam, that was it. Yeah. That was it. I was met. his style the same then? Like, was he doing the same stuff? Craziness, crazinessly. So here's the story, guys. I'm in Seattle. I'm doing all right as a feature act. You know, I'm not paying my bills. I'm trying to sell weed. I'm, I'm hooking up as a bookmaker. Like I told you, Josh mm -hmm. Wolf has an office. I got a 1-800 number. I'm fronting sports information. I'm taking numbers. I'm working it. You know, I'm trying to make, come out. I got an addiction. I got a girlfriend who's a stripper who I like how she sucks dick. I got to come up with 200 for a dinner once in a while. Yeah. So, boom, I got a feature spot on a Friday. No, I'm lying to you. This is in Seattle. This is in Seattle. Guess who's coming to town June like 5th or 6th? Herschel Walker. Doug Stanley. <laughs> and I had already made plans on the 6th to go camping with the girl I was dating. Yeah. We had already had a campsite and a truck and the whole fucking thing. And, and I'll never forget. I said, you know what? I'm a civilian this Friday night. In those days, either you worked Sunday through Thursday but unless you were working, you had the weekend off. That's just that's the level you're at. Yep. And you only got one week in the month where you worked in those days. You were just striving for feature spots. And every once in a while, you would call me and go, Joey, I got a headlining gig. They're featuring 50 bucks in the hotel room. Mm -hmm. We got to drive to Portland. Let's fucking do it. You know, that's how you learn to get into the club. Sure. You know? Featuring is the way into clubs. Into clubs. People ask me that all the time. Like, you know... Do, do your thing and then find somebody who's headlining and get, and get them to feature for you. That's the way in. That's the way they want you to get in. That, no, that's the Come way Come with it. somebody that's kind of vouching for you. I'll watch you work for the weekend and I'll decide if I want to, you know, have you come out. And then they work with you in a way. They do. They start bringing you as a co-headliner. Yep. They have you fill the holidays. So, Friday night, Doug Stanhope's in town. Like June 5th or 6th of 1996. And at that time, I had worked with a lot of good acts in Seattle, you know, like headliners. And I'm like, okay, I'm in good fucking company. Mitch was up there at the time. Yeah. Uh, Tom Rhodes would go up there. There was a lot of comics that were out in the up and up. And, dog, I'm going to tell you how it is. That motherfucker got on stage for a late show on Friday night. And 20 years later, I'm going to tell you, I had never seen anything like that. 
Really? He tore that room mm-hmm. in half. But at that time, he was really wild. Mm-hmm. That's when he was doing his bucket of vaginas joke. Yeah. That's when he was doing his, uh, you know, just, just, just the raw shit in the world, you know, with the bikini. The, the bikini was somewhere in there. She was so fat. It was like flaw, dental floss or mm-hmm. whatever. He was just throwing fucking heat. And I got to tell you something. I left that at night, and I doubted myself as a comedian. That's when you were... Uh, yeah, that's that was... Many times like that Saturday, Sunday, like that Saturday and Sunday, I was like, maybe I can start being an electrician again because I'll never be able to do what I just saw this weekend. Mm-hmm. And I processed it, and I go, that's the goal. That's the guy. That's the guy you you gotta emulate. That's the guy. That that thing that's wrong is right. See what I'm saying? That's great. That thing that's wrong, it's what's right there. That's yep. what's gonna get him to the top, and that's the style you want to have. Yeah. That thing that's wrong, that's right. You know what? It's very easy for me to look in the mirror and go, you know what? I'm a handsome 25 year old. Let me go up there, talk about this, 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 and this, and take my fucking chances. Not have any chops. And then there's the guy that uh, knows where he's coming from. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he. I don't even know what happened. I'm so fucking high. Though. Look at this fucking Jamoke. And then you, you're high. You're looking at me, hypnotizing me, trying to make me fucking higher. You understand? You look this. I, I know I said it last time I was here, and the time before that, I believe I said it, but this time I really mean it. This is the highest I've ever seen you look. Well, it's only twelve hundred milligrams. That's it. <laughs> did you take an extra two? No, not yet. I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. When? I took it before. You, t- you looked at me like a mook, so I didn't know if you took it. Or Let's get him to eat some more. Yeah, he needs two more. He's more. Taking, he's got to get early. Dude, you need I two have... more, bro. Oh. Tebow, you look good. Thanks, buddy. I feel good. Really good. Your eyes look really fucking good. Oh, really? I, I'm going to almost start to think you're hitting him. How long? How long? <coughs> uh, little, like, re- right around eight months right now. You know, went out, had a... Uh, uh, had a meltdown one weekend, uh, just anger, anger, you know, and then uh, actually I talked to you right at right right then, well, right, after, right after that, and you know it's just, and then you know one thing that you got to do is like, and you you and I say that all the time, it's like man, this ain't a perfect thing, you know, and it's like shit's gonna get to you, man, and when it does, you just got to get right back up, right. And that's the difference between me and like all, any time ever when I've been sober. It's like when you when I would fuck up, I'd be like, "Nah, man, see, I already fucked up. Might as well just be out for fucking till it's really bad again." You know what I mean? It's like you gotta just like, dude. Okay, cool, man. It's another day. It's another day. There's a moment every day where I look around my surroundings. I look at Lee. I look at you. I look at my wife. Delicate. It's delicate. I look it around and I look at the people in my life now and I look to the people that I had in my life then. And for some reason, every day, just to keep me sane, I look at all these things for a split centimeter because that's where we get the addiction from. Mm -hmm. I think of the darkness for like a a split second. You Mm -hmm. you think of uh, running into a building and Mm -hmm. what your life used to be like. And it's like a fucking movie. It really it, is. It plays, you don't even remember it, being in. It plays in my head like a movie. I went to Hollywood the other day, took a side street, and I got goosebumps. That was the street I used to make the right. And, and, but there's a little Jewish center for kids. You just randomly did this, it and not and, even... And, me, and in those days, there was no kids being shot mm-hmm. yet, so there was no security guard. So I would park right in the Jew center and just wave at the teachers, and they would wave back at me. But once somebody got shot, somebody got shot around here at Wilshire Boulevard, somebody mm-hmm. coming out of... They had security guards, so I couldn't park there no more. I used to park mm. there and go get blow. And you think of those creepy nights. Me and my wife always have a conversation where I made it take me at 3 in the morning to get blow. I lied to her. We got to go over there and get a CD for a movie. I have an audition tomorrow. I have so to watch this film. Horrendous. And I could tell it doesn't take a genius to know that she knew why she was there at 3 in the morning parked outside the building. Eventually. You might get away with it a couple times, but eventually it, you're going to be like, come on, man. We both know what's going on here. At least be honest. You know? I thought to myself the times I thought I could never even imagine that my life would be clean. Never mind be married and have a child. There was never. It all ever, starts with one day, it all starts with ever, one moment. 
ever, you know, for people who think it's, I, 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 for two fucking years, the last fucking, you know what I would do? Let me tell you the deepest shit, because what the fuck, why do a podcast so we can't get deep? Totally. You know, I would be one of those guys that I would snort half the package. And lose it. That was where I was. I could take a gram of the best. Lose it like you can't find it. Lose it. No, 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 no. Lose it in my mind. Oh, sure. I'm the type of guy that the way I am with weed is the way I've always been. Listen. You see how you see how I smoke cigarettes. I want the best coke in town. I want the best coke in town. So when you meet that Mexican, you call me. And you would call me a professional. Go, Joey, listen, you go in and cop. But I got a guy. You got to see this shit. Clean, Mm -hmm. 1980s, Mm -hmm. eyeballs, the whole fucking thing. And uh, at those days, I was snorting half the package. I'd go upstairs and whack off. And then I'd, I'd go out, make believe I was writing, and I'd do uh, a couple more little fucking bumps, mm-hmm. you know. And then the last package, I would take inside and lock the door in the bathroom. And I would actually do them in front of the mirror to prove to the mirror this is the last time I was doing coke. Right, and I'd have a, a forty-minute conversation with the mirror. I yeah. go fuck yourself, go fuck your mother. You fucked up my life, you son of a bitch. I go yep. with, and I fake the tears. <laughs> you fucked my life up, but and I rip the coke and I throw it in the fucking toilet. And like that's it. I'll never do coke again. That's the last. Now, would you actually I, throw coke away or just the no? Empty I would bag? the empty pack. Of course, get fucking confused. Yep. Mm-hmm. No, don't I get I'm, fucking confused. I had a wall in Boulder. I had the Rocky apartment downstairs, and I had this shitty bathroom that you actually. Slid a door open, and it was a metal shower. It was four hundred a month. I didn't give a fuck, mm-hmm. you know. And they had a sink and a nice bathroom. The, the landlord was a cool motherfucker, but he had put a piece of sheetrock up and never finished it. And there was a little slip back there. So the last of my coke, I had windows in the apartment, so I would never do coke out there. So I would always take him to the bathroom and do the last little bit and lick it and throw it in that wall. Oh my God, one time after like nine months, in my mind I was convinced I threw one in there with a fucking package. I ripped the wall open. Of That's course. addiction. And I gotta be honest with you, there were so many little packages, I was embarrassed. I was like, oh my God. I didn't right. want it, but guess what I did? I opened each one of them. And licked each one. Licked them, looked in there, snorted it. Isn't that incredible? Oh my God, incredible. It's incredible. So I think of that shit for two minutes. And I, I remember one it. time looking in the mirror. Uh, my buddy had a gun, and they're coming in uh, to, and it was a un, 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 it wasn't his gun, and but the landlord's coming to like do like all these inspecting things. So he's like, hey man, let me put you know it's in the case, all that kind of shit. We fucking store this at your place till the landlord's done doing this whole inspection. I don't want to see this fucking gun. So I had it under the bed. wasn't loaded. wasn't loaded. I don't even think I had bullets for it. But I remember being fucking hammered. I was coked up. I was drinking by myself, doing coke by myself. Um, the party's long over, long over. Even though it lasted another five, four or five years. But I remember looking in the mirror and putting that gun in my mouth, and just looking at myself and being like, "That's how it'll go. This it'll go down like that. I can make." And because I wanted to see what it looked like, like with me with a gun in my mouth. And then I and I started crying. I'll be very honest. I was, then I started crying because I was like. I wasn't crying because I was like at that point in my life, but I was crying because I was like, who's making these fucking decisions? I'm not the kind of dude that just like puts a gun in my mouth and is like, let me see what it looks like. You know, if I'm gonna kill myself because I was so depressed and so, who's making those fucking decisions? Who's, what part of my brain goes, yeah, that gun's under your bed, man. You could put that in your fucking mouth. See, just see what it looks like. You don't even have bullets. You don't even have bullets. Who? What mechanism in my brain is in charge of that shit? And it's always been my addiction, man. It's always been, it's always, it's always, you know. And as long as that, I was talking to this kid. Uh, I met this kid at a uh, at a meeting today, and he was a fan of comedy, you know. And he's a fan of podcasts, so he's like, "Man, I saw you at this meeting, and it was really a surreal moment for me because I actually hear you talk on different podcasts and and all that sort of shit." And he's like, you know, I'm an aspiring young comedian too, and blah blah blah. And um, but I don't know if I'm an alcoholic or not. I don't know if I'm an addict or not. And you know, I'm just kind of trying to figure that out. I go, well, and he's like, well, why did you, as far as comedy, what was one of the reasons that you quit? I mean, because I, I really quit because I was going to die, um, or just have a horrible life. And I was like, because I can't compete at the level of comedians I hang out with. 
with booze and drugs in my life. You know, you think, you know, you, Rogan, you know, all these different, Ari, all these different, con- when I was doing open mics, yeah, man, I could drink and do blow and fucking bang with them. You know, when you're featuring, yeah, you can, but when you start getting to a level where everybody's got a goddamn, you know, fourth degree black belt in comedy, if I'm fucking slipping up and getting, I can't compete. You know, I'm just a dude that's, that drives home and is like, man, I better go back to plumbing. I better rethink this game because, you know, it's like it's all about giving yourself a motherfucking chance. For me. For me. No, I, listen, I feel the same fucking way. I remember going, you know what? I've done movies. I've done TV. Sure. I can't get fucking arrested. This has to end. I remember being on a plane and Rogan throwing one of his fucking uh, remarks out and going, you know, man, when one thing is broken in your life, it affects everything. And that saying stayed with me for about a year. Mm. It ate at me. Every time I did a line of coke, it really did. The worst. The worst is knowing better. Having, like, Uh, knowledge in your head and then fucking booze in your gut. And you're like, why? I think about it. Why? Some nights when I'm bored, I'm like, could you imagine me right now going to a bar in Hollywood and getting a gram and locking myself in the hotel room and doing a couple bumps? How much you would hate yourself? No, no, no. I couldn't even imagine. I couldn't even imagine. I don't even want it in my fucking hand. I can't even have... I'm to the level in my life that I was around drunk people since I was fucking four. My mom had a bar. Same. I'm done. I'm done. I just want to you know, smoke a number and relax and go back to my room. and Maybe there's some fucking Milky Way or something or fucking bottled water and you just sit and... You watch an episode of Law and Order and you go to bed. That's the yeah. excitement I want. It's so fucking weird how you, everything changes, you know? And you guys were talking earlier about like a bar, like the bars you liked. A few weeks ago, my girlfriend was away in Europe. I was bored one night. I tried to, I tried to go to two bars. One bar I went to was up the street from where I used to live. An Irish bar and they were singing karaoke. So that was, that was out. I'm out. I don't want that. And then there was a sports bar down the street from my house. So I went, I went there, and at like 11 p.m. on either a Friday or a Saturday, there was literally three people in the bar. So I had, I literally, I, I, I had a Diet Coke, and I left. But those are the bars with the parties going on. No, no, you no, just it, gotta turn that motherfucker loose. You sit there, you have a couple. Those are the nights where I had the best time going, maybe having three quarters of a gram in my pocket, uh-huh. going into a bar like that. You order a beer. They ask you for two fifty. You're like two fifty. Yep. Oh fuck. What do you want? Let me get seven a beers later. I know every yeah, person. Yeah, yeah. You know every that person place. coming out. I know how you old call the one bar of your friends is. That got lives in the neighborhood. You got come. Oh my god, those are the spots. Yeah. They got Sinatra on the jukebox. Mm-hmm. The bartender's got cheese and crackers in the back. That's the okay. shuffleboard. They got yeah. This this and you know what? This I know there's bars like that across the country. Like like I said, you know what if. My extent in a bar, like, you know what I miss? Having a good lunch at a bar. Mm. Like, just a bar that's dirty. That you know there's rats in there, but the lunch is sensational. Yeah. And they have the TV on. They have Sports Center on. You yeah. catch up for an hour. They have a 12 o'clock serving. Fries and a, and a BLT serving, kind of thing. Something like yeah, that, but something a little kinda... more healthier. Like, nothing fried. Like, maybe a salad or, like, a nice meal. Mm-hmm. You know, a, a salad with vinegar and oil. Maybe, a, like, a... a who the fuck knows? Who's that my fucking Bobby Flay? I don't fucking know what the fuck. I'm doing. <laughs> you described an incredible me like everything you're gonna eat to him in uh, Austin. Oh yeah, that's gonna be awesome. Please, Lee's got his own menu. He's got his whole fucking thing. Let me give some shout outs. Sure, buddy. Uh, we got my man Big Billy ninety one, my parish Mickey, Joey Zaza tweets, Roy Loco Nuka, Danielito Trevisio. Randy Perez, Crystal Johnson, thank you for going for Black Sabbath and giving me the review, and Morgan MMA. There you go. You got any fucking tour dates? Uh, when does this go up? I mean, I know it's live on Tonight. YouTube right now. Tonight. Okay, so this, this weekend, Friday, I'm at the Ice House. Uh, Sunday, I'm at the Melrose Improv. And end of September, I am in uh, La Jolla at the Comedy Store down in San Diego with Theo Vaughn all weekend. And then November 4th, I'm at the Tiger Room in Fort Wayne, Indiana, recording my new album, Return to the Red State. 
and that's two taping so if you want to go to that hit me up and uh, otherwise look for that probably the first week of Christmas you're and really as always, PunchDrunk, PunchDrunkSports.com. You can listen to me, Arn and Sam fight every Tuesday from noon to two. You're really putting it together, the pieces in your life, man. I'm Try it, brother. Dude, every little day that you don't fucking go backwards, you at least are going forwards. But the most astonishing thing of what the situation happened is that I was notified by three or four people on Twitter yeah. to check on you. Mm-hmm. That you were saying some things, or you were saying some things, and I remember calling you, and you mm-hmm. called me back, and then you said what had happened, and I'll never forget that. That I found out from people who really cared about you on Twitter that knew I cared about you, yeah. and I was like, till this day, I always apologize to Twitter for the shit I said five years ago on the Joe Rogan podcast. Who the fuck? What kind of people you want to be friends with on Twitter? We have a great fucking community. It's and, amazing and for them man. to reach, and now they got Brody on watch. Yeah, Those motherfuckers on Twitter got Brody on speed watch, Jack. Dude, you know what was cool about that? The exact same thing. All these Twitter fans are also great. Like Mickey Gall, who just fought CM Punk, been a fan of Punch Drunk, been listening, starts calling in, gets a UFC contract. Now, he, you know, he calls pretty regularly. But all of our fans on our show have got to know this guy and then see him get his first, you know, this this guy's dream coming true. He's a 24-year-old guy, fighter. You see his dream. The Twitter... Like, every fan of Punch Drunk went to some bar or ordered the fights. Not because they wanted to see Mio sick in, the, in Overeem, heavyweight. They're like, I got to see fucking Mickey Gall, you know, because they've been listening to him. Dude, the support he got just from our fans on our show was, it was, it was moving to me. You know, them having my back, you know, when I'm like fucking, you know, it's a, it, we're it, this all is, very this connected, dude. We're all very connected. I do a periscope and I always say, man, we're a family. Where else can... Family, sit down for 10 minutes and smoke dope with your fucking Uncle Joey. Listen, ha- listen ago, to a this, side of an album. Yeah, this couldn't happen. This couldn't fucking happen. So I love it. And I love what's going on with you. I think about how lucky I am. I swear to God, teams, every day that I got that curse off my back. Mm-hmm. Me too. I have to. And it all started with Martin the Fag. I've always thought about that. Martin the Fag put a curse on me for stealing his coke. He went to the Cuban gods and he says, if he wants to smell coke, let him smell coke. Let's get more of the coke he can. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. They threw a fucking voodoo curse on me. And I don't know how it got cleansed off me, but who gives a fuck? Dude, you're here Jesus now, man. Jesus Christ, I think about just how lucky, for the love of Christ. Yeah, how and lucky. it's like, you know, there's also a huge part of me that's like, I've been there, done that. Like, what more can I do? Playboy Mansion a bunch of times. I mean, there's nothing you can... What party am I going to go to where I'm like, oh, this now it's worth it. I did it all. I re- had a 20-year run where I did some amazing, incredible damage. Some of it was fun. Some of it was quite fun. But it's like, you know, I'm trying to come up. You know what I mean? I'm trying to live up to my potential. I'm trying to be the kind of dude that helps other people who need to get out of the fucking shit that I was in. You know, and from there, it's whatever. From there, it's whatever. But being that dude that's stuck in that fucking hole that can't help himself isn't going to cut it anymore for the second half of my life. First half, yeah, that's what happened for the most part. Second half, not so much, you know? And to be able to to have that wherewithal to be like, you know, if anybody's struggling, hit me up, you know? So, so many people from the last time I was on your show, I've talked to on Facebook, Twitter, you know, back and forth of like, Hey man, you know what, what? What did you do? You know, I'm just as fuck. I sound like I'm just as fucked as you were. You know, and a lot of these people are still sober. A lot of them are at least co- cognizant of the fact that this is the same something to fuck with, man. I've lost a lot of friends to drugs and alcohol related. You know, overdosing, suicide, car accident, hit by a drunk driver, drunk driver themselves. You I, know, I've tried to talk to Lee about this for the last couple of weeks. And- I did something that I never fucking do, man. I finally cut somebody off and told him, I was once told by a dear friend of mine, it was another way of telling me to go fuck myself. He looked me straight in the face and he goes, the next time I see you, you better be pulling up in front of my house with a white Cadillac. And don't call until then. And it killed me for a few minutes, but then I thought what he was saying to me and he made a lot of sense. And I finally had to say that to somebody, and it felt great. Like, don't call me till you get a white fucking new driver with a white Cadillac. Mm-hmm. 
because it just got too much. This is not going to end good. We, you and I, we we see the fucking, and I've been her friend for, you know, 15, yeah. 20 years, and what kills me was she had it. The, the people 99% of the time they do. They, yeah, she had it. Like, if she you was, can just get out of your own she way. She was doing comedy. She was hanging out, drinking sodas, no drama, because you could tell when she's drinking. She doesn't have to tell you. You don't have to smell it, the behavior. The uh, behavior uh, changes. And the funny thing is you think you can lie. Oh. You, know, you see a sweaty Joey Diaz come oh up God. with the jaw going and the fucking egg cock sucker. You, know, no, what you I talked at a different level. I would, but I would never do a line and go on stage. The problem with me was that I was telling somebody that. I would do so much the night before. Like, I was sweating all the fucking time. Lee? You were sweating out yesterday. What do you mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I see what you know. You were going to tell me I was sweating yesterday. Oh, no, I wasn't. No, no, I'm what saying that's when, when you people would see you think you were jacked up. No, you were sweating out yesterday, shit. I'm not even, gun I'm not even jacked up for like another couple hours. Lee, when I was 370 and I would go on stage right. and I wouldn't have material, I thought I was cuter than everybody else. You know, Rogan was feeding me, like, just go up there and say this. You'll fucking knock him dead. Yeah. And I would go up there like a wild man. And I would start bombing at the six minute point, and I would have a 20 minute set. Lee, I can tell you as a man, it would pour out of me. And he's my witness. It would, even in the, in the original room, I would you, bomb. If I were to pour this on my oh face, oh my I would God. Just run the off cocaine my had my body yeah. that whacked. I couldn't walk from here to the car. If I stayed out in the heat a little bit and I started sweating Lee, I'd lose a fucking gallon of water in no time. Fuck. There's different times in like in the in in the comedy community that we you know I'm gonna say grew up because we grew up in different areas of the country, but at the comedy store and in, in the Hollywood scene, it's a lot of times it's somebody's turn in the barrel. They say, you know what I mean? It's like uh, you know there was times where everybody was so worried about you. Everyone's like, man, I don't know, man, Joey, he's looking big. He's always on a lot of coke, man. He's I don't know if his heart can take that kind of lifestyle. Oh my God, no. Then do you remember when Ari had his run when he was going through depression? And Ari was very depressed all the time and talking about suicide a little too much too seriously you know that was his kind of turn in the barrel it's like when you go through it it's like you know like you were saying with your friend you're like you know she had it but then you just go right you know you get right back in the barrel and eventually everyone's got to be like all right we're all going to do what we can to try to help this person but eventually you got to meet halfway i got to meet you halfway every fucking person can't tell me hey you got to quit doing this hey joe you got to start taking care of yourself hey you got you know you got to take it but you're like, I know, motherfucker. You think I don't know that? You know, you have to be willing to go like, all right, yeah, 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 you're right. I'm sick of this shit. You know? I can't believe how much of a mess I really was. <laughs> and every day that I look back, I see how much of a mess. I mean, not socially and physically. Sure. Just emotionally. Yeah. I was going through something. And looking back, it was the whole thing that went on in bold, how angry I was. They were screwing me over. It was affecting me. And mm -hmm. at night, I'd go home and I couldn't deal with it. You know, at night, I didn't want to be me. You know, the day, I can really relate to that yeah, 100%. At night, you don't want to be you. You so, just, the last thing you want to do is go home. In those days, Lee, if you were my friend, right? you were out till five every night. Paul is waiting for me. Let her wait. We're hanging out. Let's talk about the podcast. We have. We already talked about this eight times. I, I don't want to play fucking Spanish music. <laughs> I don't want to play Spanish music. No, it's amazing. I'd have him out wasting his fucking time every night. So, Tebow, like, did you have any, when Joey called you, did you have any urge to lie to him and say, no, I didn't, I didn't drink? Uh, sure. Yeah. I think you always will. I think you always will. But, I mean, you know. It, you know, there'd be people who, you know, you might just for the sake of an argument or it's not their business or whatever, but it's like, you know, I knew why he was calling and it's like, I'm not going to, if I'm not taking advantage of having those kind of relationships in my life, like to be fortunate enough to have somebody like Joey, it's like, hey, listen, I heard, I heard you're not doing so good. Give me a call. I want to talk to you. It, I lose, I lose what the universe gave me that connection for if I don't take advantage of it and be honest. You know what I mean? If I don't call him back and be like, hey man, here's what's up. Thanks for calling, blah, blah, blah. You know, right? Yeah, because like I can I can see where you're like my first reaction would be to lie. Oh, of course. Especially with something like you're like I would like if I'm ashamed about it. Yeah. Yeah, shame is a big motherfucker for that. You know, 
Like shame, shame, shame will keep you out. Anger will keep you out. Resentment will keep me out. Any little fucking angle. You know, it's always looking for something. Excuse me. Oh my God, that's, those stars got me deep and shit, and they take me in. Don't and you got to take two more stars, Lee? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> they take me in and out like they like that. Like for three minutes. I'll How many milligrams is one star? Two hundred. So if you had, so if you the, the more you just keep eating those, the more fucked you are. I've had four. I've had fourteen hundred. After a point, it's the law of diminishing returns. I thought. Well, about of course. It. Lee and I have discussed. You're throwing good pot at bad pot. We gotta eat. We could eat three more, and the three more we'd be fucking gone. But do you guys really night, have a red eye tonight? Uh, yeah. Red eye tonight. Yeah. What time do you? Well, how many did you uh, eat last night? Four. Five. There were a couple purples and a few reds. How much? Let's estimate. Maybe six or seven hundred. Okay. We were pretty fucking high for about an hour and a half. Yeah. Like, we got high for an hour and a half. That would kill a meal. Are you going to eat a bunch before the flight? Oh, we're eating already. It's all over. No, I mean, I mean on your way there. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck yeah. We always yeah. eat something. Because this guy, they're going to be like, oh, sir, you don't look Chinese in your ID yeah, he's here. Yeah, going to be fucked up, Lee, and shit. It never we're ends. keep him on the... Lee knows what time... Lee knows this is his magical mystery talk. <laughs> there really is. Lee really doesn't understand this, that this is it. You know, I mean, uh, I don't do drugs. I don't drink. It's not like there's going to be women mm -hmm. involved. But you know what, man? People in Texas are fucking crazy. Oh. You know what? They make edibles too, and they're fucking rednecks. They throw <laughs> everything in there: peanuts, right. fucking uh, tofu. <laughs> they don't give a man my, more lizard meat, know, barbecue sauce. You know, and next thing you know, you're eating a cookie with 280 mm -hmm. milligrams. And you eat four of them because they're fucking delicious. They put custard in there and oh. fucking corn milk, and you know. Those are the ones that are the always the most date when you can't even taste it. Where you're just like, oh, that can't be that. That can't be that strong because I can't taste it. So then you have a fucking another one, and then it's like a fucking boom. When you smoke, when you smoke a joint, you smoke a fucking couple bong rips, whatever. You know, pretty much like how much you hit it. You know, like oh okay, whatever. Some of these edibles are real fucking. You pick them. It's a mystery of how hard that's gonna hit you. That's the beauty. Yeah. That's the fucking. Listen, when you eat a Valium, you expect something. When you do a hit of heroin, you expect something. When yeah. you do fucking THC. You really don't know what to, and that was, that was my first allure, as a kid to drugs. I, at first, after my mother died, the addiction became the cocaine for the pain. Mm. But in the beginning, I was into doing, uh, like hits of acid, and I would make myself and my friends go into New York City, and adventure. Yeah, and they would look at me and go, "Dog, I can't handle that." Yes, you would the same way I do the Lee. Right. Let's go. Come on, I got your back. Let's yeah. go. We get and just do bottom. acid and walk around the city. Just stop. Go over there like kids, being 15 and a half, 16, because my mom was still alive. Go over there. And once you get over there, you can get a bottle of vodka anywhere. Mm. In those days, in 80, 79, 78, somebody was in front of a liquor store. Yo, mister, can you go in there and get me a bottle of vodka? That was always vodka? a game. Give me a dollar fifty and give me a dollar fifty extra for myself. If you were walking into a liquor store right now and there were some fifteen year olds outside and asked you to do that, would you buy it for them? Not anymore. Yeah. Although throw you in jail for twenty years. Sure, it's not worth it. You know. I mean if I knew them and I knew the parents and there was a I'm the type of guy that uh there's a little bend in my game if it's a necessary reason and you present it to me. <laughs> In a gentlemanly fashion. Okay. You know, it's, uh, I when I called you and you called me back, I really respected you more than I had ever respected you. Because one of the things I hate the most, <sighs> Tebow, I heard you bombed in Columbus. No, I didn't. I did great. Lee called me and goes, he did great. You know, I don't know what the fuck you do in Columbus. Sure. I'm not that type of comic. Sure. If somebody asked me a question about Tebow's, youth or whatever i can't answer it but one thing that bothers me is when one junkie lies to another because mm -hmm. you know if i walked in here right now and i had done a bump at four in the afternoon you wouldn't accuse me but a guy like you would go hmm he's not acting like he's him not acting weird he was yeah. fidgety yep you follow me he'll take that home well with him. because it's like you you can fool 
the normal people. Yes, you, you can, can fool. fool. You could, I could fool my sister. You could fool different people, it's normal crazily. people. Crazily. But when you know it and you see it, you're like, you know, why are you wearing sunglasses at night, mama? You know, why are you, you know what I mean? Your eyes are jet black and you can't fucking sit still. It's like, come on, man. You know, don't, yeah. It's crazy, Lee. And then you'll see that. And then nothing will happen. It sits in your mind. And then one night you'll bump into Red Man. Oh, you hear about Joe Diaz? What? Dog, the other night he didn't come home for three days. His wife called me the baby. He's been fucking somebody's house doing blow again. Mm. Oh, no. Yep. And you go, you know what? It makes sense now. That yeah. day I saw him yeah. at the podcast studio. That's it. He was acting all fucking fidgety and yep. shit. Yeah, that's it. You know, you'll, you'll see shit like, and you're just like, ah, of course. Or you can just look back with a lot of people like that too and go like, oh yeah, now it all makes sense because he didn't show up for this and then he blew that gig off and then he fucking, you know, wasn't showing up. But now it all makes sense. Because a lot of times, like, that's the thing. If my, if I'm pub, if you, it's almost like how you were saying about betting earlier. If this guy says he won 50 grand, he won 75 grand. It's like that kind of thing. If if my drinking is enough that I'm you're seeing me in public drunk, I didn't just start drinking today. Yeah, you know no, what I mean. I, I see. You. Yeah, I got yeah. too much to risk right. to be showing around. So I'm gonna have a couple sneaky fucking. Oh, let me just get a six pack, watch a Monday night football game, drink it by myself. No one will fucking know that shit. No one will fucking know. You know, it's a month later before I got the balls to start showing up hammered in places. I respect you a lot, and I respect what you're doing. I love you very much, sir. You're a very uh, I not positive good influence things. in you're my life. You're fucking growing. You know what? I was in a dark place. Uh, a lot of people helped me, man. And a lot of people helped me by not saying something. Sure. You follow me? Absolutely. Follow me? A lot of times, a lot of people help you by not saying something. It's their body language and the things they do say that you put two and two together. So, so like, I, I would be someone who would be like, I would be really like upset, like you're out. Know, Upset with myself to to know whether to say something or not to say something. How do you know whether to say something? I mean, I think every instance is different with different people. I had the weirdest people say things to me. I would say that that's true for me too. I had people outside that I thought would say something to me say things to me. One of them was at the end was Rogan, but I had a. Uh, Claude Stewart. Claude Stewart. Once checked me. Dude, I've known him for a long... That's crazy. What did Claude Stewart say? Just pulled me aside and said, you don't look good. Mm. And I've been where you are. You just had a kid? Well, his wife did. And he goes, "Um, I could get you into a rehab in San Diego on one call. They'll take care of this for you. And I remember like a week later, I had like a bad coke binge. And I actually called him and said, get the car ready. Yeah, but I stayed off it for a day. I, I I got a check from a residual, and I went and got another gram and blew them all. Sure, totally. And he was offering to pay for it at the time. Wow! He was like I'm fucking with the rock. I just want you to get help. You don't looking too good. Mm. Hey man, I'm very fucking fortunate. I had good people around me. They made me believe, and somehow I got out of that fucking mess, man. And, uh, I mean, look at you now, man. Look at you now. It was fucking scary your for a whole while. life. Jesus Christ. If I would have told you 10 years ago, here's your life. No. You would have been like, get the fuck out of here, Momo. Get out of here, Momo. Baby, I'm going to be doing blow in a hotel room in Houston, Texas. After I just, that's what I, If that's, I would have told you 10 years ago, you're, here's your life, you wouldn't believe it. And then 10 years ago, if I would have told you, on this date, you're dead, and you died of an overdose. You've been like, "That's right, cocksucker, guns blazing." That's how I'm going down. I, I thought I would die from an overdose. I absolutely. I was prepared. Were you okay? Would, so you're okay with it? You were. You made peace with it. At that time, I just I know the deal. The more spaghetti you go throw against the wall, the the more it's gonna stick, and you don't yeah. know when the Lord's calling you to call. And it always happens in a weird place. You end up going to some town, you know. You're married at home with a wife. You go to a town. You pick up some fucking chick at the comedy club. She's doing blow. You go back to the room. You got a fucking heart attack. You got to explain to people what that's this how that goes in the down. Fucking room. That's how it always goes down. The clinker for me, the truth, the one that opened my eyes was in '99. A comic hung himself at one of the clubs, and I knew him not well. He worked the broker. 
Mm. And that Wednesday, he picked up a gig in Fort Collins, so he goes, do you want to drive? And that was the first time I had ever seen a mirror. Like, on the way up there, all he talked about was gambling and uh, drugs. That's what you mean. But here's the beauty of it. This guy was, I was, whatever, it was 94 when I met him. I was 31 years old, yeah. 95 when I met him. And uh, he killed himself. 99, maybe four years later, so whatever, I was 32, and I remember the, he hung himself on New Year's Eve in a hotel room in Houston off the balcony or something like Fuck. that. But the shame about this guy was that he was out here for like three years, and he was touted to be heavy duty. Like They were like, this is the dude. Yeah. But his little problem got discovered. He went on one of those road trips and just stayed in Oklahoma for a month, and that was the end of that. Nobody wanted to see him again. So for the last 10 years, he had just been a road dog. Yeah. But he was still, like, people would look at you, look at him on stage and go, damn, hopefully someday. And now he had taken his clean comedy routine TV act and tailored it to fucking bars in the Midwest. You couldn't follow him. Nobody yeah. could follow him. Nobody. Right. He was killing it, you know. Uh -huh. he, the day I had him that day in Fort Collins, he had to run to the phone eight times to gamble. He asked me to get him an eight ball, and then before the night was over, he called me back, and he goes, get me another one. I just, did you do it already? No, no, but I just want to be prepared. Oh, that was nothing worse than running prepared, out. Yeah, yeah, when they want to be prepared, I know the deal, because I used to want to be prepared. Yeah, that, that's when you're in the fucking heart of it. Lee Syatt. Yes, sir. We're very fortunate this week. The Church of What's Happening Now is going to introduce a new, uh, a new product that's... Uh, sponsoring us i love this fucking idea you know i don't know if you guys know anything about me or whatever when i was doing that coke and shit i became a nomad and i would to come down from coke i would go in the shower in a hotel or in my apartment and i would just lay in the fucking tub and i would put the hot shower on and i would whack off to come down off the coke like two or three times and then after a while, you gotta take a pee. Do you think I'd actually get up and go to the tub? Or the t fuck no, I'd just pee on my legs like a chicken. And then after another hour, the cocaine would start to wear into my system and guess what would have to happen? I gotta take a little poop. So I would actually get up in the shower and poop and I would, <laughs> and I would turn around and bend over like a, like a fucking porno star with the muffler out and as the poop was coming out, I'd have the water hitting it, because that's the type of you, savage I am. And then you would just shit in the shower. And I'd shit in the shower, and then I'd turn around with my hand, and I'd pick up the lid to the toilet, and I'd flick it in like Michael Jordan, like an underhoop, and I'd wash my hands in the shower. What percentage did not make it in the... Uh, like A hundred percent. But once my wife caught me, it was over. She threatened to throw me the fuck out of the house. You can't throw shit from room mm -hmm. to room. No kidding. But let me tell you why from I did that. Let me room. tell you why I did that, because I grew up with a bidet. Really, in your house? In you New Jersey. Oh. And, and I remember I remember moving in the first day and running into my mother's room and looking around the room and here's this toilet and here's this shower with a tub and here's this beautiful sink. But wait a second, in between the toilet and the sink, there's another toilet. And I'm like, what the hell is this? And it, it looked like a toilet, but it didn't have a hole. It had a thing in the middle. So what did I do? I stuck my head over the thing. And I'm like, hmm, that's where water comes out. So all of a sudden, I turned the water on like this very gently, and all of a sudden I turned the hot water on very gently, but the hot water slips, and the water shoots at you, and it's all over your face and all over the fucking ceiling. And I'm like, Mama, what the fuck is this? And she told me, it's a bidet para lavar de la chocha. So I never knew what the hell she was talking about. I always thought it was used, it was a woman product. Sure. And I saw my stepdad sitting there one day, and I'm like, whoa, shit, when they leave tonight. I'm like, oh, and my mom would always go, don't go in the room when we leave. As soon as they go in the room, I'd be holding a little poop in there, and I'd poop, and I'd sit in that thing like a doctor at the age of eight and nine. I'd just be fucking sitting there letting my muffler get washed with hot water. I washed my muffler in that hot water. Like, I would take regular poops in my bathroom, but that one good poop of the day, I would always jump in there because I wanted the muffler to be clean, and I'd have the right formula of hot, hot and cold, cold water. Yeah. 
in those days you just took a bar of soap and you put the indentation where your fingers went so you never touched the other side and, I, and after I cleaned all the peanuts out and the fecal matter wow. I, I would put the fucking bar of soap in there like money molly and I let that hot water kill everything the germs and everything and that was the end of that but when my mother died that all ended uh. So for 30 years, I lived with a savage, like a savage. Who the fuck has a bidet? Who's got that type of class? Yeah, the that's French. James, that's James Bond type of shit. Yeah. But all of a sudden, a buddy of mine said to me, listen, man, take a look at this fucking thing. This is tremendous. And I love the name. Hello, Tushy dot com slash church okay let me tell you people something that aren't aware of it you're sitting there confused bidets are back let me tell you what a bidet is a bidet is something that sprays your butt clean with fresh water okay i grew up with a bidet in my house and i gotta tell you as a fan i'm they're tremendous now thanks to tushy sleek bidets that clip on your existing toilet and they spray your muffler completely clean if you don't know what muffler is it's butt completely clean with fresh water to get your muffler clean so you're not sitting on bacteria causing hemorrhoids yeast infection and rotten ass which will really kill you nothing else kills you like rotten ass because it goes through your genes next thing you know people are smelling it and they're like who farted it's just you you know anyway you don't need to know about all that stuff <laughs> and one other thing but days are also better for the environment because there's no paper, more trees, my friend. And each little muffler wash uses one pint of water. That's how environmentally safe they are. And the, the best Tushy stands behind their product for 30 days money-back guarantee. What they want to do is this. Go to the webpage right now. Hello, Tushy.com. Capital H-E-L-L-O. Capital T-U-S-H-Y. S. -S hy.com go right now take a look at what they got you're going to be impressed they got two types of bidets that are going to rock your world you thought your muffler was going to stay dirty that ends today go to hellotushy.com right now go to slash church go to the box and press in church and get 10 percent off your order okay that's how i'm going to do it just for you going to the web page right now today it's a tremendous Christmas present. If somebody's birthday, let's pretend you went on a date. You know, you took it to a restaurant. You went down there and you smelled something. Listen, who doesn't need a bidet more than that girl? You understand me? True. And, and how you give it to her is, listen, she'll look at you all weird. And you go, no, 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 no. Listen, this is because I'm going to go down there like a savage. I'm going to take you on an around-the-world fucking tour. And they understand what you're saying. The bidet, they'll love it. Anyway. Go to hellotushy.com right now, slash church, and press in church for 10% off. That's how I'm doing it right now, today for you. That's the type of savage I am, all right? Again, that's capital H-E-L-L, -L, capital T-U-S-H-Y.com, slash church. Go to the webpage. Look at all the fine options they have to offer you, all right? I love this product, and so the fuck will you. And next is my people of people. Thank God I'm going to Austin because one of the things I'm doing, I'm going on it, dog. I'm going to get a box of those mixed greens. I'm going to get as much fucking hemp protein as I can. I'm going hoop, doop, de doop down there. You know why? Because on it works. The Alpha brand, you got 100% money back guarantee. Okay? Who does? Who gives you that type of shit if the product don't work? You don't like it? It ain't working for you. You get you caught. We don't even want the product back. Bam, we'll give you your fucking Gitas back. But it all starts by you going to onit.com and look at the fine line of supplements. Also, they have weights, kettlebells. I can't get you hooked up on those, but supplements, I'll get you 10% off right now. Go to the box and press in. Church. Boom, C-H-U-R-C-H, -H, and I'm getting you 10% off. Again, do me a favor. Go to hellotushy.com right now. I'll tell you why. The holidays are coming. And I'm going to get you out of there nice and cheap, cheap. And who doesn't need a bidet? Who doesn't have a dirty asshole? Everybody. Nobody loses. Nobody's going to go, what a surprise. I didn't need one. And then I'm excited because ever since you get a girlfriend, you go through like eight times the toilet paper. Well, guess oh. what? So they, they, that, guess that's what? over. That's they true. Sent, they sent you one. Fuck yeah. You got one coming oh, yeah. shit, Jack. Yeah. And what you're going to do is you're going to take Paula home. You're going to connect it. And while she's got her muffler on, she's going to like mm. her little monkey. And guess what? She's you can do it before and after. And guess what? Guess what happens after you do that? 
What well, happens? she's getting the hot water in her muffler. You lick mm-hmm. her monkey. What do you think happens? The stars. She's moving in the next day. She's going to go home and stab her mother in the neck and just move <laughs> in. That's how good that is. You're going to take her on an around-the-world excursion. You understand me? That's why I like the, this product. It's a tremendous little present for the holidays. For holiday, whatever. You, everybody, I'm telling you. And everybody, it, everybody's 69s and you smell something. If you smell something... That person needs HelloTushy.com right now. I'm excited to get it because it looks easy to install. And Real I, easy. And I'm a dunce uh, putting stuff together. Like, I, I I can't do anything. So if I can do it, literally anybody could do it. So this I'll, is we'll, we'll report in. My brother, I'm happy where you're at in your life. I'm Thank happy. you, buddy. You know you always got my help. If you need someone, you got to do Same goes to you, brother. I'm happy where you're at. I'm happy you're not fucking in the, the realm of uh, beyond the realm of debt. You look good. You look healthy. Thanks, man. You, you got family close to you again, and that's and Ari's back hopefully soon. And Lee Sayet. Yes, sir. Get this podcast up. We're going to Austin, Texas, cocksucking about two hours. Let's do this. Let's do it. We got a private jet coming to pick us up. We're going. We're going to Tito Barrow. We're going to Miami to pick up the sound machine. We're going to stop <laughs> in Houston and pick up fucking El Chapo. And then we're going straight to fucking uh, Austin, Texas. Chapo's coming? Chapo's coming. Nice. That's how we fucking roll. Right. And listen, I'll be in Austin Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There's a few tickets left. Capital City. And don't forget, next weekend, I'm in NYC Friday, Saturday. Two shows Friday, two Saturday. Gotham Comedy Club. Again, few cool. tickets left. Stay black. We'll be back next Monday night. Rip, ripping this motherfucker. One more time for my brother Jason Tebow. One more time for my little brother, Mr. Lee Syatt, this bad motherfucker who I love. Where's the fucking new chucks? Get the brisket ready, Austin. That's right, motherfuckers. You coming to eat? I'll see you motherfuckers for lunch tomorrow. Stay black. Suck it. Uncle Joey, Jason Tebow, my main man, Lee Syatt.